projections. We'll get immediate reaction from JP Morgan's Priya Misra, J uh, KPMG's Diane Swank, Bank of America's Michael Gapin, and PGM's Robert Tipp. And finally, we will get the news conference. We will parse every word of Chair Powell uh, with respect to former New York Fed President Bill Dudley and BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg's incredible insights. John, really, this is the show, and I'm very excited to be part of it. A fantastic lineup alongside us, Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, great to see you. Do you think we're ejecting a little bit too much excitement into this one, or is this the real deal? One to watch. Um, it's not one to watch in terms of getting any actions. It is one to watch in terms of signals, but it is particularly one to watch with respect to the press conference, because Chair Powell's going to have to decide what tone does he take at this particular moment, and does he repeat his performance at in front of Congress, which is maintain a very steady course, or does he impart significant volatility into the marketplace as he's done in previous press conferences? We should mention that semi-annual testimony was only in the last few weeks. Has that much changed with a hot PPI report and a hot CPI as well, or at least hotter than expected? At the margin, yes, but not enough for him to surprise the market. What I find fascinating is all the questions you've raised, Lisa. This is supposed to be a very transparent Fed. This is supposed to be a data-dependent Fed. And yet, all these questions have arisen. And I think that we're looking for spurious accuracy. And in the dots in particular, there's going to be spurious accuracy. You know, it doesn't take much to go from three to two cuts. And, and yet, the market will probably amplify if that happens. Amplify means sell off, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Amplify means that basically if they go from three to two, you get uh, sort of a sell off in bonds and stocks as people reassess just the willingness of the Fed to cut in the face of harder than expected inflation data. That's probably what's going to happen. It shouldn't happen. This, this is really spurious accuracy. We should say two to three high, if two to three cuts starting in June, July. But to go beyond that right now is going to be very difficult. Do you think that it is the correct policy of the Federal Reserve not to update their long-term neutral rate at a time where this is ultimately one of the biggest questions? Where are you cutting to at a time where it does seem like inflation is a bit more embedded than it was pre-pandemic? So they should be doing it, but this is not a strategic Fed. This is an excessively data-dependent Fed. So they are not very keen on embracing this whole forward-looking, what is the equilibrium rate, et cetera. So we're not going to hear much about that this time, but we will hear a lot about the data. I'm most interested in what do they do with their PCE projections? Do they leave it at 2.4 for core headline, or do they take it up? That's, that's the one you should lo look at. We've got to gauge his confidence as well. We know he was getting a little bit more confident, but looking for more confidence. This is how ridiculous some of this has become. Do you think, based on the data we've had over the last month, that he has lost confidence, gained confidence? Which one? So if he is consistent with being so data dependent, he should have lost some confidence. We've had three hotter than expected inflation prints. That tells you something. Um, but if he were to look forward, we get back to this whole issue of what is the right inflation rate for this country and how quickly should you get to 2%. Um, that's, that is w why his press conference is going to be so, so Every delicate. time we bring this up, you mentioned this point, you think they should push out the timeline for this, don't you? I do. By how long? By a couple of years. You think it's going to be that difficult to get back down to target? Yes. We, why? Because we're living in a world where the supply side is inflexible enough. And you get almost every week you get indication of changing supply chains. You get indication of the labor of the tightness of the labor market. You get indication of an energy transition that's not going as well as people want it. All these things mean the supply side is less flexible, and the underlying inflation rate that is consistent with economic well-being for now is somewhat higher than two percent. Do you get the sense they see it the same way on the FOMC? We don't know because they don't speak about longer term issues. They tend to be so data dependent. And remember the data dependency issue is that you're driving a car looking through the rear view mirror. The other thing they tend to be, and we saw that very clearly in December, is that they tend to be influenced by markets. You know, John, I had this image that the market goes on a roller coaster, and the Fed's role is to be looking at the roller coaster, not being in the roller coaster. However, the Fed has tended to be influenced a lot by the market's roller coaster.
Well, at this point, it doesn't sound like they have. If in December they weren't pushing back against some of the enthusiasm we started to see in markets, they basically turbocharged it. Will they be taken on that roller coaster and try to tamp down some of the enthusiasm that we've seen with equities making all-time highs? So remember, December market was pricing in seven cuts for this year. And Shire Powell surprised everybody by a very dovish pivot. If he is to stick to that, now the market is pricing just less than three cuts. Does he pivot more hawkish? That is the problem they're getting themselves into if they are overly, overly influenced by what's been happening in the market and by the data. You should take that into account. It should inform and influence your decisions, but it shouldn't impose on what you say. When you say that this is a very data-dependent Fed, what data are they looking at? We keep talking to people about the choose-your-own-adventure nature of this data. Do we have a sense of what has more import to them than other indicators? So they've told us they look at um, different variants of inflation where they take out a few things that they think we shouldn't be looking at or that are distorted. So they do look at that. They certainly look at the labor market. And they look at not only what's happening to wages, but also other indication of the tightness of the labor market. And they do look at what's happening to the economy as a whole. So I do think they are very, very overly influenced by the, by the backward-looking data. And they do take a holistic view. A question that Lisa and I have asked a million times over the last month or so. I want to ask it again of you. Biggest risk right now, based on what we know, just based on what we know so far, what is the biggest risk? Waiting too long to cut or cutting too soon? This Fed will, the biggest risk it faces is of being overly tight and pushing this economy into a recession when it, there's no reason for it to go into recession. So holding too long. Yeah. And how would you define holding too long? Going beyond June? Going so later this year? Going later, not doing two to three cuts, being hawkish. You know, it's a different Fed. Entering into this inflation shock that they got, they tended always to be on the dovish side. The inflation shock that they got has reminded them of the 70s, and that's something they do not want to repeat. So the balance of risk, if they're wrong, is that they're too tight rather than too loose. Interesting, because, Lisa, that conflicts with some of the other things we've heard from, say, Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho, who thinks that their rich interest rates, just the economy and the economic data, won't cooperate. Which is part of the problem that some people are looking at with some of those base effects of transition to different kinds of technologies. When it comes to uh, nearshoring and rejiggering supply chains, all of these inflationary impulses, how does the Fed counter those while not torpedoing the economy? Which do they prioritize. What we're hearing is the labor market takes precedence, and that seems to be where a lot of people seem to be leaning, including Jay Powell. I just wonder whose argument wins on the FOMC today. And we can talk about this through the afternoon. Governor Waller, who's kind of saying, what's the rush? President Kashgari, why do anything, given the economic data we've had? I just wonder if the Hawks win that argument on the FOMC going into this decision in about 18 minutes' time. Mohammed's going to be sticking with us. Coming up very shortly, we'll catch up with Kathy Jones and Charles Schwab alongside Deutsche Bank's Matt Lazzetti. Your equity market on the S&P 500, negative here by 0.1%. In the bond market, yields just a touch lower, 467 on a two-year, on a 10-year, 428. world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars.
very close to all-time highs going into this Fed decision. Equities pulling back just a little bit. We're negative by 0.1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, down about a tenth of 1% in the bond market. Some decent moves over the last week or so. Yields repricing higher. At a front end, the low of the year in January, 4.1% over the last week, back through 470. Lisa, on a two-year right now, 467. People really pricing out the idea of more than three rate cuts this year. Now it goes over to the Fed. Do they say, you know what, you are correct, market, and we are actually leaning toward maybe two rate cuts rather than three? Does that have a material sell-off effect in the equity markets as well as into bonds? Following the excitement of the BOJ just yesterday, Dolly Yen, it's amazing. Just want to check in on the FX market briefly. 150-158, seven consecutive days, Lisa, of Japanese yen weakness. This dollar going into this Fed decision, absolutely dominant. You know, on, this has been maddening. This has been a maddening period of time. Frustrated, exhausted. You can say whatever you want, but get the call right. Good luck getting the market move right. Basically, people are trying to figure out where we are in a new paradigm of history. We've got the Bank of Japan, yeah, exiting negative rate policy, but oh yeah, they're basically still tacitly doing yield curve control. And then over here in the U.S., you have to wonder, the economic data is so strong. And we're going to hear from Fed Chair Powell, look at all the potential negatives. Right? So at what yep. point are we seeing any kind of cohesion that we could trade off of? I don't know. Let's get to work. 15 minutes away from that decision. Joining us is Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab, Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank. Kathy, got to begin with you. How are the summary of economic projections going to look at 2 p.m. Eastern time compared to where they were back in December? Well, there'll probably be some upgrade to GDP growth and near-term inflation, just a mark to market. But I don't think there'll be a big shift in the out years. I don't think that we'll get a big change in the expectations for growth and inflation longer term. Um, and you know, that's not going to give us much information. So they can mark to market for this year, um, and that doesn't tell us anything about the future. Big question we've got is whether we come down from three on a median dot, Matt Lazzetti, to two. Only takes a couple of policymakers, Matt. What's your base case going into that dot plot. So our base case is that they stick with three cuts this year, but as you mentioned, it only takes two people to move. So I think there is a very real risk that they move to only expecting two cuts this year. We expect the dots further out actually to come up 2025, 2026, and the long run dot to move, move higher. I think how much impact that has on markets will depend on you know, how many dots move for 2024. Is it a signal that there's a wholesale rethink about the, the policy outlook? And then obviously how Chair Powell um, communicates it in, in, in the press conference. My expectation would be that even if they move to two cuts, that Chair Powell does want to keep June live and on the table for, for a rate cut. And if it does, that, that should moderate any effect on the market. Matt, has the balance of risks shifted and been more toward uh, weighted toward the inflation picture rather than the deterioration picture? Look, I think you've gotten two stronger than expected inflation prints. Uh, the breakdown of those inflation prints was not good from the Fed's perspective in terms of higher shelter inflation, higher core services ex shelter, the things that they're worried about being stickier. So yeah, I think you know just over the past two months or so, you have seen a shift. And I think with the SEP, we'll have to look at um, how much the, the risks around their inflation outlook have changed. But I think we, think we also have to be cognizant. They are hyper data dependent. If you get two more better inflation prints through the June FOMC meeting, you know, I think they'll feel better about that, that risk management consideration and be able to, to back off and, and reduce rates at that point. Matt, what do you think better is? What would look like better? I think you need 0.2% uh, core PC prints over the next two months. I think they need to see year-over-year -year core PC at 2.5% or, or lower. That is our baseline expectation, but obviously we also are a little bit more uncertain about that, uh, have a little less confidence in that than we did two, two months ago. In the press conference, Matt, what kind of language do you think Chairman Powell is going to reach for? The same kind of words that he used only a few weeks back? You know, it was somewhat surprising to me that, that two weeks ago he said that they're kind of, quote unquote, not far from having that confidence. Um, you know, I would think that he's a little bit further away after getting another um, uh, worse, worse inflation print. But at the same time, I th think that there are enough one offs uh, at the beginning of the year, seasonal adjustment factors, uh, portfolio management inflation picking up, that they still should have confidence in the disinflation trend. I expect them to communicate that um, and, and to suggest that really they just need to see a few more data points. And if they get that confidence, that, that they're willing to cut rates. Matt, just the last question on the balance sheet. We were told this was going to be a big meeting on the balance sheet. How big is it? What kind of decision should we expect if we should expect any decision at all? 
I think it's a big meeting in terms of discussions. I don't think it's a big meeting in terms of decisions or announcements. So they're going to have an in-depth discussion about the balance sheet, mostly focused on what do they need to see to uh, slow down the pace of, of, of QT. I, I think we'll probably get more information from the minutes than we do from today's press conference. I think Chair Powell will probably just give us a readout of what those discussions were, right. and we would expect an announcement actually in May or June. Interesting. Matt, I know you've got to run. Great to catch up. Matt Lizzetti there of Deutsche Bank going into this Fed decision about 10 minutes away when we get the statement the summary of economic projections, the Fed's outlook. 30 minutes after that, we'll get the news conference. The scores going into it on the S&P 500, pulling back just a little bit, down a tenth of 1%, all-time highs that are closed yesterday. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year. Here's the price of things for you. The yield, we're down a basis point on a two-year, 4.67. With us around the table, Kathy Jones of Schwab, Mohammed al Erin of Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, we're talking about the balance sheet as well. Let's have that discussion now. What kind of considerations need to go into the decision that they're potentially going to make at this meeting or even the next one? So I think, two, the monetary policy consideration and the stability, financial stability consideration. And they've got to balance, on the one hand, the need for the balance sheet to um, come down for monetary policy purposes, but also to do it at a pace that is slow enough not to risk financial stability. Cathy, what are the financial stability risks? Stocks, all-time highs, credit spreads, super tight. It feels like the regional banking stress of last year was last year's story. It looks like we've moved on. Should we be concerned about any of that stuff at the moment? It looks like it's diminished risk uh, versus where we were a year ago. Uh, but nonetheless, we're getting to a point you know, in the repo market where it becomes important that there's enough liquidity in the system. And um, they're trying to figure out what that balance is precisely in terms of drawing down uh, a QT to keep enough in the system and still continue to reduce the balance sheet. And they're really stuck with those mortgages. I mean, the part of the problem, they're just stuck with these mortgages it is for now, and that's going to be a problem. Kathy, let me take you back a few months where everybody was wondering about the functioning of the Treasury market in view of massive issuance by the government. The question was who was going to buy, and you have QT on top of all that. What has happened to all that discussion? Households have stepped up. Uh, when we look at who has been buying, it's the usual suspects have continued to buy, but the increase above issuance largely has been households. So when you look at people, they don't even realize they hold. If you have money market funds, they have treasuries. If they hold you know, short-term treasuries, they hold short-term bond funds. Chances are they hold treasuries. And as those yields hit 5%, had a big jump in households. So I think that 5%, in my view, has been the level that's really pulled in a lot of capital. And I, when it comes to issuance, I don't sit around. I don't put that high in my list of concerns. There'll be a buyer. You know, Mohammed, Kathy's talking about all this cash sloshing around. And when we were at Bank of America yesterday, they talked about how savings accounts are 40% higher now than they were pre-pandemic. Where is all of this coming from? especially because the Fed's supposed to be draining the system of liquidity. So I think the household liquidity is A, how much it benefited from the pandemic, and B, let's not forget, when we see strong employment, strong wages, that generates income, generates um, all sorts of financial balances. I think what's fascinating, and Kathy, I would love to hear your view on this, is how did we go from seven cuts to two to three while stocks reached record high. Had we been here in December, and I would have told you the market will be proven wrong, and it will price in three cuts by March, I doubt we would have said, and stocks would, be, would mark one record high after the other. So how do we explain that? Yeah, fortunately, I don't do equities, so I don't have to explain <laughs> what's going on in the That's equity market. That's a pun, because the equity markets do bonds. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I have my colleague, Liz Ann Saunders, I think is going to be on later, and she can explain that to you. I do think we, when we were pricing in seven cuts, it seemed we never changed. We had three to four this year. I don't really know what people were looking at, except the previous history from the Fed was always when they hit an inflection point, they tended to go pretty quickly. And at that point, the, the numbers were deteriorating. But now, you know, we've come back. The economy is more resilient than expected. Inflation is a little stickier than expected. So we've righted the ship here. And we had some communications from the Fed that also pushed back on that notion. Uh, what they're doing in the equity market, though, I have no idea. Before you even ask that question, guess who wrote in? Neil Dutta, Renmac. This is what Neil had to say. If they move the two dots from three and come down to two on the median dot and they're revising up growth and inflation, is it really a big deal? 
Earnings are up big. He's talked about nominal GDP. Equities are doing well. And this brings up the Mark Cabana question over at Bank of America. And Kathy, I think we have to think about this to some extent. Mark Cabana at Bank of America was telling Lisa and I yesterday that maybe the bond market should be looking to the equity market for clues as to what's happening here. Stocks are rallying on better nominal GDP data than we expected to start the year. Perhaps yields need to play catch up. How would you frame that one? Well, when I look at real rates, even nominal rates where they are, um, I don't think we have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, if you're running inflation, say core PC at 2.9% right now, uh, and we have a Fed funds rate of 5.5, that, that's a pretty big spread. That's a pretty wide uh, real rate. So does the bond market really need to readjust if the Fed stands still for a little while or pushes back more slowly? Um, we've also seen some softness, underlying softness in the labor market. And I think we're, that's been a little bit lost in the conversation recently. Some of those numbers are looking not so great. The quits rate, uh, when you look at part-time employment versus full-time hours work coming down. A lot of noise in the data, but I think if I were at the Fed, I'd want to get more numbers on the labor market before I made a big decision one way or another, which is why I don't think we're really going to see big change. The thing I was getting at with all of the cash sloshing around, Kathy, is how much is the Fed fighting the battle that fiscal spending has created and essentially it puts them in a very uncomfortable position because there might be some underlying weakness. But essentially, at the end of the day, fiscal spending has often driven inflationary cycles. How much are you looking to understand what they view as their role in this tension that's very political and something they don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole? Right. Now, it's, it's a tough job. I'm glad I'm not trying to stand up there in front of uh, everybody and answer those questions about fiscal policy uh, at the press conference today. But it's true. Fiscal policy has been very supportive to households. And you have a lot of jobs. And when people have jobs, they spend money. Um, and so the Fed has to adjust their expectations based on that. Well, but we had this in the early 80s when fiscal was on the accelerator and monetary policy was on the brakes. Right. Right. And we saw, and we saw what happened there. Do you think it? How much the, of the '80s, rather than the '70s, do you think we're going to see? Oh boy, I remember the '80s. It was great for bond trading. I mean, we had so much volatility every day. It was fantastic. Um, that being said, um, I, it doesn't feel like the '80s to me. I don't think we had the same uh, dynamics in the economy that we had in the '80s. You know, you were getting huge increase in, in labor force participation then. Uh, women coming into the workforce. So the baby boomers just sort of hitting their stride. Um, that was a more dynamic economy and a far more volatile um, commodity situation. We've got a bit of a rise in commodities now, but it's nowhere close to where it was in the 80s. So I don't feel like the dyma dynamic's quite the same. I'll tell you what this reminds us of, and we've been talking about it over the last month or so. This reminds me of the post-GFC period in reverse. So post GFC, we're all waiting for liftoff, waiting for liftoff. And every single bank on the street was forecasting liftoff about a year out. 12 months out, the Fed's going to start hiking. They had to wait five, six years for it to happen. Mohammed, I'm wondering whether this era is going to be that in reverse, where every three months we're looking six months out, waiting for liftoff hikes that never come, or rather cuts that never come. Is that going to be the GFC period, post GFC, in reverse? So let me give you my probability distribution, because, and you tell me whether you agree or not. Sure. 55% we soft land. 30% we go into a recession. 15% we never slow down. Whether you call it a no landing or you call it a positive productivity shock because of AI. Just 15. 15. OK, so 55, 15, and then 30 that we, we, we hard land. Is the 15 the one that's had to be revised higher? since the start of the year? It's the 55 that has been revised higher. OK. OK. So, so, so that's how I think of it. In that context, it is unlikely that we will not cut rates this year. Kathy Jones, thank you. Great to catch up with you. Alongside Mohamed al Mohammed's Mohamed's going to stick with us going into this decision. Let's check out the scores. If you are just joining us, we're about a minute away from the Fed decision. The scores look like this going into it. Equities very close to all-time highs, pulling back just a touch. Bramo, we're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. We're very, very close to all-time highs. This is not where we thought we would be. To Mohamed's point, at the start of the year, we had March penciled in. Many houses did, looking for a rate cut in March and anticipating that if we pulled out those cuts for this 
this year, down from six towards the Federal Reserve, who were at three, then this equity market would sell off. This stock market has not sold off. And we've been talking about Jensen versus Jay, and that's sort of where we're at right now. The NVIDIA AI craze versus Jay Powell trying to put the brakes on an economy that seems to have more gas left. This is really ultimately the question. It doesn't surprise me that there's very little uh, movement in, in stocks or bonds right now, because why would anyone try to front run this, given the proclivity to maybe a little bit more volatility post news conference? Well, let's turn to the bond market and we'll talk about where we've been before today. Yields have been climbing higher over the last week or so. Fixed income, treasuries, two year, 10 year, 30 year, look like this. We're down about two basis points on a two year, 466.61. On a 10 year yield, we're down about a basis point or so. 430, very close to the highs of the year on a US 10 year. Right now, 427.68 and very close to 470 on a two year. With your Federal Reserve decision this afternoon, we can cross the DC with Mike McKee. The Fed sees higher growth, stronger inflation, and slightly lower unemployment for 2024, but officials still barely see a median of three rate cuts for 2024. Nine of the 19 members, however, said they thought two or fewer rate cuts would be appropriate. Ten saw three or more. They did not change rates today. The dots move up a little bit next year. The median sees two cuts to 3.9% in 2025 instead of three cuts, three more to 3.1% in 2026, a slightly shallower path. The committee's median long run, the natural rate, also moves up to 2.6%. GDP is projected to increase 2.1% this year, a significant upgrade from the 1.4% in the December forecast. Growth is also higher in 2025 and 2026. Unemployment will end this year at 4%, Fed officials now say, instead of 4.1%. And core PCE inflation will fall, but only to 2.6% instead of the 2.4% seen in December. Headline inflation unchanged at 2.4%. The only change to the statement is job growth is no longer characterized as moderating. Language about considering any adjustment to the target rate, commitment to the 2% inflation target is the same. The decision was unanimous. And finally, there was no mention of the balance sheet in the statement beyond keeping the $95 billion in Treasury and mortgage rate caps each month. Mike McKee, I'm going to turn to the price action in a moment, but I've got one question I need to ask you right now. Let's go through what you just said again. So faster growth, lower unemployment, higher core inflation, then something jumps off the page. It's exactly the same median dot with some changes around the surface, I know, in and around. It's more nuanced than that. But ultimately, the exact same median dot than December, as December. Mike, can you make sense of that? How have we just revised growth higher, revised unemployment lower, and core inflation up for 24 and left the median dot unchanged? Well, you have to look at it as the median dot because others did change their views around that dot, but nobody moved significantly higher to push rates up. One person did. They needed two to move it up, to move the median rate up. But as I noted, nine of the ten now say two cuts or less. So it is certainly possible if we see similar uh, inflation and jobs numbers going forward that this could change again. And at the next meeting in June, when they put out a new forecast, they could go to two. I guess no wonder people are buying stocks right now. Mike, we'll come back to you in just a moment. On the S&P 500, positive by a third of 1%. Here's the price action for you. Stocks higher. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.4%. In the bond market, a rally at the front end. We're down about four basis points to 4.64 on a US two-year yield. And the dollar a little bit weaker here. The euro at 108.85. Brad, my first reaction to this, just to see faster growth for 2024, lower unemployment and higher core inflation. And a median dot, we can get into the changes beneath the surface, I know, but a median dot that's unchanged in the face of all of that. If you're in equities at the moment, that sounds pretty bullish to me, doesn't it? This is a Federal Reserve that suddenly, under the hood, seems to be accepting 
higher than expected inflation for a longer period of time, taking longer to get down to that neutral rate. Because there is no other way to interpret all the numbers that you just laid out, hotter inflation than expected for the next couple of years, faster growth, and the fact that they're still planning for similar types of cuts highlights where the bias is right now for a Federal Reserve that still does want to cut rates. If you're just tuning in, joining us around the table, Mohamed El Arian is alongside us together with Priya Misra, Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at JP Morgan Asset Management. Priya, I want to cross over to you. Just your first thoughts on the projections and the statement that we got just moments ago. I think this is a Fed that really wants that soft landing to continue. They saw a path of that for, uh, of, of, for that soft landing. Now, we have had better, you know, uh, better inflation data, higher inflation data than the Fed would have liked, I think, the last two months. But it's two months. You know, you just go back four months. We had really weak inflation data in November and December. Jan and Feb came in a little higher. I mean, it was never going to be a straight line down to 2%. I think the Fed is saying we're going to be patient. There's a long time between now and December, those projections are December projections, that growth getting Higher, I wonder if they're telling you the supply side's working, whether it's population growth, whether, whether it's supply chains coming back. That's allowing growth to be strong. That's allowing the labor market to be OK. And the Fed is saying, be patient. We're going to get close to that 2%. It might take a little bit longer. We can start normalizing. Well, it's fueling a rally in gold. Gold is up by 0.6% off the back of some of this. Mohammed, your thoughts on what we've just heard from this Federal Reserve? So I would have agreed with everything that she said, with one exception which is a revision up in the PCE call to 2.6. So that, that puts me more in Lisa's camp. I think this is a signal, and the market is taking it as that, that they will tolerate slightly higher inflation for longer. And this is a reason why uh, maybe if you look incrementally under the hood, you're seeing some inflation expectations over the longer term start to pick up just a little bit. Priya, from that point of view, does this kind of call, all things being equal, make you less enthusiastic about longer term treasuries if it seems like this is a Fed that wants to stick the soft landing regardless of what the data might be suggesting and even their own projections? I would say the belly of the curve is, is still the most attractive because, you know, whether they start, whether they cut two times or three times, Let's look at the total amount of cuts that's priced in. The neutral rate that the market is expecting, or the end point, is 375. I mean, the Fed's neutral rate is 2.5. The market is well north of that. So the part of the curve that's the most, I'd say, sensitive to the totality of rate cuts is that 5 to 10-year part. You're right. Going out into the 30-year, into the there's term premium, there's supply demand. But I will say if the soft landing continues, that $6 trillion sitting in money market funds starts to go into bond funds, equity funds. That's a positive for duration as well. Mohammed, I have to say, this idea of potentially inflation being higher for longer, when is it kind of a sort of tacit acceptance of two point something, something you've talked a lot about, rather than looking for 2% as even a goal? If it takes 10 years, are we talking about 2% as the target anymore? No, if it takes 10 years, then we're not talking about 2% anymore. <laughs> um, I, I think you're getting that tacit agreement that in order to achieve the soft landing, we have to redefine what we think is the inflation rate that goes with that soft landing. It is not two, I think it's nearer to three than it is to two. And I think that this is a first step in this process. I wish that these forecasts came out before the semi-annual testimony because I do wonder how different the questions would have been. There would be serious questions now about how serious they are about getting inflation back down to target, Lisa. I think we have to go through these numbers. If you're just joining us, here they are. So I'll give you the number now, the forecast for 24, and you can compare it to December. As Mike McKee explained quite clearly, these are the median projections. 2.1% for GDP for 24. In December, it was 1.4. The unemployment rate for 24, 4%. In December, it was 4.1. PCE. 2.4, December 2.4, core PCE, 2.6, December 2.4. The median dot for this year, unchanged at 4.6, implying three cuts. Now, Bramo, if you put that in front of any committee, any press conference, the obvious question for any journalist today, this afternoon, is how serious you are taking it to get it back to 2%. Because based on that, I mean, what are you taking seriously? And I think you absolutely nailed it. Are they beginning to tolerate something a bit above target? Because ultimately, they want to prioritize the labor market over inflation data that is noisy. And they've talked about that in 
higher than expected. I will just say, if it came up for semi-annual testimony, I wonder if they'll ask about Bitcoin because they probably wouldn't read it and then ask that question. But I'm glad that we have uh, good journalists who are going to be asking that question in the press conference. I think Senator Warren also sent another letter recently saying you should cut rates like right now. Maybe they're listening. Yeah, I I'm sure that won't come up in the news conference <laughs> a little bit later. Joining us to discuss this one is Dan Swan, the chief economist at KPMG, alongside Bank of America's Michael Gapin. Dan, I'd love your reaction just to these projections and what you've heard so far from this Federal Reserve. Well, I think a couple of things are really important. First of all, the threshold to cut rates is a little higher than many people thought. But also, they're not talking about raising rates, even though they've had this higher inflation. And I do think, remember, they're going through their process of reevaluating where rates are, where, what is the optimal inflation rate and what is the optimal policy path. And I think on hedging, what they're doing right now is they're saying, we're willing to hold it higher for longer to get there. And, you know, Jay Powell really made this point that markets sort of ran off on in December is that we don't think we need a recession anymore to get back to our inflation target. They're willing to be patient to get down there. I do think over time there is going to be a debate of what is the optimal inflation rate? Is it 2.5%? I don't think it's closer to 3 but I do think that there is something to the fact that they're willing to tolerate a little higher inflation for a little bit longer rather than higher unemployment. But they also are not willing to you know, raise rates again, and I think that's important too, but the threshold to cut is a little higher than it was prior to this meeting. Dan, before I get Mike Gapin's thoughts, I just want to come back to you on something you said. We don't need a recession is very different to we don't want one. Do you think that is the difference this afternoon? Is this we don't need a recession to get inflation back to target or we don't want one? Diane? Oh, I, I think it's that they don't need a recession. They don't believe they need a recession, and they don't want one if they don't need it. So I think that's really the important two pieces to this equation is that if they had to take a recession, you know, August 2022, bucket of cold ice on us at Jackson Hole, we'll take a recession if we, do, we need it to get inflation down. They were wrong. We didn't need it. They got pretty far. We've made enough progress now that to take a recession to make it the last of the last mile on this road on inflation, it's not worth it. And I think that's the hedge that you're seeing played out right now. Mike, there also is a bit of a shifting in the goalposts, given the fact that we're looking at inflation that's coming down, but not coming down to 2 percent, and then that's OK. That is considered success. How much is this statement and these projections really signaling an acceptance of higher inflation for longer to you? So to me, it's not. I mean, the, they're, I think they're looking at changing policy today or setting policy today and trying to get to their macro objectives over the three year forecast horizon. They're, they're still saying we'll get there in 2026, which is the same story that they've given in the past. So yes, they have to tolerate a little higher inflation in the near term this year and, and next term, next year. But I don't think they're giving up on that 2% goal. I think the, the flavor to the revisions to me says the median member is fully embracing this supply side story and the economy can run faster, at least temporarily, without generating significant overheating pressures. So to me, that's the main message from, from the statement. Uh, although I acknowledge with revising up the inflation path, two tenths this year, one tenth next year, does say we, we may have to have a little higher inflation uh, in the meantime, but I don't think they're giving up on that 2% target. Priya, I see you vigorously nodding. You agree? I completely agree. I think it's the supply side. That's the key. I think the entire soft landing was predicated on the Fed starting to ease. What they're telling us is that the starting point, I think the starting point matters. We're at five and a half on Fed funds, 10 year real rates at 2%. At this is restrictive policy. Can this start to normalize, start to cut a little bit, not the entire cycle. They don't have to cut consecutively all the way down to 2.5%. Start that process of normalization. If that means inflation is a little higher than their target this year, so be it. We'll get there in the next couple of years. If the supply side is working, it allows growth to be strong without creating inflation. Maybe the target is 2 to 3%. I don't think they can politically say it or have much credibility. It's like me saying I can't run a marathon when I can't run 100 miles, um, meters. But <laughs> essentially, you know, when you can't reach your target, you should not change the target. But can they act as if you'll get there? If we just push out that 2% a year out or two years out. I think that's what they're telling us. They're telling us, let's start, 
We're not committing. This is a data-dependent Fed. We can decide 25 and 26 cuts. We have a lot of time to do that. Let's just start the process now because we're in restrictive territory. Priya, is that a reason to buy the 10-year Treasury or sell it? Uh, the 10 years is harder. It's a, it's a reason That's to buy I the five-year. Um, <laughs> for now, I would say buy it um, because I think this keeps demand coming into fixed income. I think the rates market was actually slightly hawkishly positioned into this meeting because of this debate between two and three cuts. Um, the equity market, risk assets have been on a tear. I mean, there's been nothing stopping that. I don't think now anything stops it because unless the growth data weakens, the Fed's telling you they're willing to let this run. They're willing to eat to allow that soft landing to continue. Dan, I'd love your thoughts on how to navigate this news conference when there is such a clear and obvious contradiction in the median projections for 2024. How do you think Chairman Powell will explore this one in 16 minutes' time? Uh, he's going to be straight in and full on, and we're still committed to getting to 2%. He will not back off that kind of... Um, rhetoric, and I think that's important. He's saying we're just willing to, we've not changed the time frame. It's just going to come down a little slower than we thought. But also, there's a trade off. You know, are we willing to create unnecessary pain, which is the Fed's word for euphemism, euphemism for unemployment? For no reason. Do we really need that at this point in time? And I think what they're saying is no. We see, even in the labor market, we've seen a surge in immigration. We've seen a rebalancing in the labor market that's continuing. If the labor market were to get significantly softer, they would cut more rapidly. I think that's the other side of this that is interesting is that we were seeing that we saw are starting to see sort of a division within the Fed on what are the balance of risks. But at the end of the day, the Fed is looking at the saying, we've had a pretty resilient economy and there's no reason to derail a resilient economy as long as we're moving in the right direction. How fast we get there doesn't matter given the progress we've made. And I think, you know, it does matter if it's 10 years, like Mohammed said, yes, then it's not. But I think in the context of what, where we've been and what we're doing, this is sort of the more, the way to think about it as a way to not cause undue pain in the economy for no reason. So then I agree with you. And, and I think it's important that we're redefining patience. Um, going into this meeting, patience meant there's no rush to cut rates. Now patience means we may have to wait a little bit longer to get to 2% or the path will be slightly different. But whenever I say that out, um, the reaction, the pushback I get is, but that's going to destabilize inflationary expectations. I don't think it well, will. So Do, you agree? It has... Do you agree that yeah, it, it no. will not? Yeah, I'm with you, Mohammed, on this. I don't think it will because we've seen remarkably anchored inflation expectations throughout all this. Now, if it did begin to, the Fed would be changing its tune pretty quickly, right? So this is something they're looking at. They're looking at that inflation expectations have been fairly well anchored, and that's a good sign for them that this is an okay path to take. But you're absolutely right. If we were to see inflation expectations shift on the basis of this, they'd have to change their tune and their strategy. And Mike Gape, and I want to give you the final word going into this news conference. What would you look for? Well, I think that the balance, uh, so what's been discussed here is essentially, you know, I, is it, do you really have a higher bar to start? Are you less confident about starting? We all th seem to think that they still have a lot of confidence about disinflation remaining in place. So I, I would kind of address those, those two confidences. And, and honestly, I, I would try and tease out any information on the balance sheet discussion. The market, I think, needs to know, that does taper start when overnight reverse repo balances are just low, or do we have to get to, to zero on that? I do think some information there would be helpful. I think we'll be getting some questions on that, no doubt about it. Mike Gapen of Bank of America, the brilliant Diane Swank of KPMG. To the two of you, thank you. If you are just joining us, 13 minutes away from a news conference with Chair Jay Powell of the Federal Reserve. No change to interest rates, plenty of changes to the outlook for 2024. Faster growth, lower unemployment, higher core inflation, and then I guess the news is where there is no change. The median dot still implying three cuts for 2024. Now, you're all making me feel a little bit uncomfortable because you all agree with each other, so I've got to be that guy, and I think Lisa's on the same page as me. There's going to be a lot of people watching this that just think, well, hang on a minute. There's a huge contradiction in this, in all of this, that you've revised higher 
inflation, revised lower unemployment, you're looking for a faster economy, and your projection for rates stays, un stays unchanged. That sounds super dovish. And I would say displays a real tolerance for above target inflation, with equities at all-time highs and credit spreads very, very tight. Why are we wrong when people come on this program and say we are sufficiently restrictive? In fact, some people come on this program and say significantly so. Where is the evidence of that based on what we're seeing this afternoon? Where is the evidence, Mohammed? So the evidence was given to you earlier by Cathy, which is if you just look at one price, which is where the policy rate is, relative to where P core PCE is, that's where you get the restrictive. But I agree with you. If you look at the financial conditions as a whole, these are very loose financial conditions. One thing that I'm looking at in the statement is that the Fed took out language saying job gains had moderated. It really was the only change to the statement. Priya, from your perspective, everyone's been saying it's all about the labor market. If we don't see moderation in the labor market, and if it's actually reigniting, how are we going to get down to 2%? From, from here, if maybe people are saying it's restrictive, the equity markets and the credit markets didn't get the message. So I think the labor market is coming in better balance. It, it is moderating. It may not be moderating in terms of NFP numbers every month. It's moderating in terms of the quits rate. It's moderating in terms of job vacancies or, uh, or average early earnings, ECI. You look at measures of wage inflation, it is moderating. I think that's what gives the Fed comfort that those inflation expectations will be anchored, that even if core PC is a little bit higher, that's, that's largely due to shelter or, or medical insurance. There's lots of little components of PC that might be keeping it a little bit higher for longer. But as long as the labor market suggests that wages are moderating, I think it gives the Fed that confidence. And I would say for them to start to cut, I think cuts in 2024 are about inflation. A PCE has gone from 5.5% to 3%. That's a reason for them to cut 75 basis points. Cuts next year are about growth in the labor market. To me, Mohammed, this all goes back to your point, which is, is this a Federal Reserve that is operating without an overarching kind of thesis? They're basically just trying to cobble together people's different opinions and putting something out there, and then it sends us all in a tailspin trying to explain some sort of cohesive theory behind it and where we're going. Is that what this smells like? We're trying to sort of rationalize and come up with a theory behind this when it's really this person thinks this, this person thinks this, this is a good kind of happy medium. Go figure out what's going to, what to do with this. So if you want to be generous, you'd say this is such an uncertain economy. There's so many things changing on the structural side that they have no choice but to behave like they're behaving. If one would be less generous, you'll say this is a Fed that actually took a view. It looked through data in 2021 and ended up really undermining its credibility. And therefore, it is very hesitant to do anything more than simply look at past data. So it's up to you whether you want to be generous or less generous. The decision nine minutes away, we'll find out if Robert Tipp is feeling generous of PGM. He joins us now. Robert, you've had about 20 minutes to chew over this one. Your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in terms of supporting what they've done, uh, the rate of growth of the economy has been firm. The rate of inflation has come down at a headline basis by, you know, five, six percent, uh, by nearly three percent on a core basis. Uh, the question came up earlier, do they want a recession? I think they want a soft landing. And they got conditions restrictive enough to bring down inflation quite a bit. Uh, wage growth has decelerated, and they managed to do that uh, Keep while well unemployment has remained low. Growth has continued. Uh, so I think it's been uh, a very successful go. Did they start late? They did start late. Um, but I think their pandemic practice, you know, was a little bit late. I don't think we have a lot of uh, active central banker data points in terms of how you're supposed to do it. So I think uh, so far, so good. And I think they're trying to hone the message so far here. You said very positive on all of this. Does that mean that you're a buyer of bonds of all durations because you think that ultimately they will get to the goal that they're looking for, along with the soft landing that's always been called sort of the unicorn that never arrives? Well, I think the unicorn arrived in 2019. After the 2018 cycle, we were on our way to a soft landing. Uh, that was uh, interrupted by pandemic, so maybe not. Uh, the late 90s, another soft landing after the 94 cycle. So I, I think they are there. I think uh, the, the problem is a lot of people saw the dot-com bubble burst. Uh, they saw the GFC burst. And we don't have that kind of a backdrop now. And a lot of people are used to seeing funds rate up, funds rate down. 
crash, big problems. They're not used to seeing it. It doesn't mean it never happened. Uh, so it has happened and uh, looks like we're on our way there. Is this a buy point for fixed income? It is. Uh, strategically, when you get to the end of the Fed rate hiking cycle, that's where you're going to be seeing the peak in interest rates. That was probably at the end of September last year. Uh, we are getting into that buy zone at the end of 2022. We remain there now. Uh, we're seeing a lot of support for the market. I think that's why the risk premiums in the market are so narrow, but they're likely to remain narrow. But I think overall, they're, they're managing a very successful uh, course here. So, Robert, clearly a soft landing is your baseline. So speak a little bit to your level of confidence in that. And what do the tails look like if the Fed were to end up making a mistake? And we hope it, the Fed doesn't make a mistake. But if it were, what do you think the most likely mistake would be? Right. Uh, well, I think the, the data has not only bifurcated, it's trifurcated. Right. So when you look at the employment, I was a little surprised that they went, you know, unidimensional, that it's, uh, you know, a super employment market. I mean, the household survey has been flat for a few months. Unemployment rate is inched higher. Uh, jobless claims at a state level have gone higher, uh, triggering some people to wonder about whether the SOM rule is kicking in, signaling a potential recession. And of course, recessions are very hard uh, to spot. So I think if there was going to be a problem here, you're not going to wake up one day and see data consistent with a 3.5% growth. But is it possible that we could have downshifted to a half percent or a percent, uh, that job growth has really dropped off here, and uh, you've lost a little bit of momentum? I think that's the more likely side that things could break on. Having said that, they're at 5.3%. Uh, they have tightened in real terms. They've made the case they didn't really want to do that. Um, now they're making the case they want more information. I think if they see slower uh, data, that would you know trigger them to make some cuts, which would end up you know probably preempting a recession. Uh, so the most likely mistake would be uh, mistake would be kind of a growth recession. I would think that would be the the next most likely scenario there. Priya, is there a downside to keeping inflation hotter for longer in the idea that this is actually really problematic for particularly lower income households? As Mohammed and I were talking about before the show, that this is sort of, you know, very much uh, a tax on particularly people with lower income, specifically for those who are not in the market and can't capitalize on some of the gains that we see in the equity markets and could have a drag on the economy. Sure. I think as long as the job market is, is fine and wages are running above inflation. So you talk about that inflation number being high. Where are wages? If wages are running 4% and inflation's at 25 there's still positive real income growth. So I think as long as you have positive real income growth, that danger that you talk about is less of an issue. I do worry about the danger from is the Fed easy for too long or does it let the market run on this narrative of rate cuts? If inflation stays high enough at some point, the Fed's idea of continuous rate cuts is going to get questioned. And I think that no market is pricing that in. I think risk assets are expecting rate cuts this year, rate cuts next year. So if that inflation tends to be that last mile problem actually exists and we find we're unable to get close to 2%, I think then we should reprice all those long end rates higher, which is a problem for, you keep talking about uh, credit spreads. Is that a problem for spreads or overall, or overall risk assets? I think that's the danger I worry about. I don't think we're there yet. It's still, it's, it's noisy data, but I think that is something we should watch as we see the totality. And I hope Jeff Owls asked about that. Is it three-month moving average? Is it core, super core, shelter? Yeah. I mean, we have so many variables. We look at revisions, wages. So hopefully he's asked, exactly. you know, and I'm sure he's going to give a non-answer answer, which is everything. <laughs> but maybe some nuggets in there. It's core and super core that we look at. I think just a sense of what gives them that confidence that overall we're going to get to 2%. Francis Don of Manulife was on the programme earlier on this morning. She said exactly the same thing. Just tell us what you're looking at. Seems to change from meeting to meeting. Robert, I know you've got to go. It's got to catch up, sir. Robert Tibb of PGM going into this news conference three minutes away. Mohammed, what do you want to hear from the chairman in this news conference? What do you want to hear him address? What I'd like him is to come across as steady, to not get the market excited, to not cause undue volatility. That's what you want. What do you expect? <laughs> it's hard. I would not like to be at. Not generous view. I would not like to be at that podium after this outcome. I really would not like to be there. Why is that? You think the members have put him in a little bit of a sticky spot? Yeah. To explain this. I mean, you've repeated it over and over again that the data revisions and their projection, their, their revision to the language, projections, the revision to projections are inconsistent with 
the, the non-change to the rate cuts. How difficult is this going to be, Priya, in two minutes? I think he's pretty good at doing that. I think he might, you know, at least try and get that delicate balance. I mean, he is going to be asked about financial conditions. They've eased a lot. I think explaining that's context dependent. Financial conditions by itself, the Fed should not have a view on. It's relative to the economy. We, we're in a soft landing. Financial conditions should be easier. Now, all they can do, all he can do is explain the reaction function. We didn't get any data today. Explain the reaction function. They remain data dependent. I'm also looking for anything on QT, you know, because we have tax season coming up. That overnight reverse repo facility might get to zero in the next two months. What are they doing then? Are they getting close to tapering? They're going to debate this, and we get a September 19 event. That's a big shock to the system. I don't think is, is priced in. You know, John, everyone's been talking about the fact that we haven't heard about the balance sheet. It wasn't in the statement. And to me, this is actually a wild card, because it's this sort of tacit yeah. tightening. They're going to allow it to run off for longer than people previously expected, because this is one tool that they can do without getting into the rate cutting dance. Does that help him today, considering that he doesn't think it's passive tightening and this is just watching paint dry? <laughs> Does that help him? Well, based on what Priya was just saying, it sounds like this might be watching paint dry as well, because she was basically like, he's not going to give an answer. And Mohammed's like, please don't shake anything up. There's a reason that we're waiting for these comments, though, on the balance sheet. It's because at the last meeting, he sat there in the news conference and told us that it would be a big meeting for a conversation about the balance sheet. So maybe you hear about that up front when these comments begin. Maybe that's one way to kill the mood in the room, just to talk about the balance sheet roll off and just go into exact detail about what this means. There are a lot of questions. I want to hear financial conditions first and foremost. Exactly how he responds to that. Does he brush it off in the same kind of way that he did back in December? It's not a major deal, but it's the beginning of something that could be a big deal. There's just a clear and obvious contradiction in the outlook for 2024. I think if you see a repeat of that through the year, there's going to be more and more questions about how willing and how they are really focused on, whether they are really focused on getting that inflation number back towards 2%. It suddenly goes back to Priya's analogy, which is your target can be to run a marathon. But if you don't really run it all, and you just you know run a mile a day, and you don't plan to do it until 2046, is that really your goal anymore? And I think that that's sort of one key question here as we talk about what is an inflation target that we're looking at that's 2%. It's a complicated spot for the chairman. We've got equities at all-time highs as he's about to open that door and sit in front of that lectern and talk to us about the outlook for rates. Equities at all-time highs. And at the same time, they're revising their inflation predictions higher and also still forecasting the same amount of cuts for 2024. I think that's a sticky spot for any Fed chair to walk into any room and speak for 60 minutes on this subject. Which is a reason why he will probably say we're data dependent, which also means nothing to a lot of people who say, what are you looking at? This is a very difficult moment as Jay Powell walks to address all of the complexities that we are facing. Here's the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Good afternoon. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. The economy has made considerable progress toward our dual mandate objectives. Inflation has eased substantially, while the labor market has remained strong. And that is very good news. But inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured. And the path forward is uncertain. We are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustainably strong labor market that benefits all. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy has been putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. I will have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. <clears throat> Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. GDP growth in the fourth quarter of last year came in at 3.2% for 2023 as a whole, GDP expanded 3.1 percent, bolstered by strong consumer demand as well as improving supply conditions. Activity in the housing sector was subdued over the past year, largely reflecting high mortgage rates. High interest rates also appear to have weighed on business fixed investment. 
In our summary of economic projections, committee participants generally expect GDP growth to slow from last year's pace, with a median projection of 2.1 percent this year and 2 percent over the next two years. Participants generally revised up their growth projections since December, reflecting the strength of incoming data, including data on labor supply. The labor market remains relatively tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 265,000 jobs per month. The unemployment rate has edged up, but remains low at 3.9%. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers, reflecting increases in participation among individuals aged 25 to 54 years and a continued strong pace of immigration. Nominal wage growth has been easing and job vacancies have declined. Although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. FOMC participants expect the rebalancing in the labor market to continue easing upward pressure on inflation. The median unemployment rate projection in the SCP is 4.0 percent at the end of this year and 4.1 percent at the end of next year. Inflation has eased notably over the past year, but remains above our longer run goal of 2 percent. Estimates based on the Consumer Price Index and other data indicate that total PCE prices rose 2.5 percent over the 12 months ending in February, and that excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.8 percent. Longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as from measures from financial markets. The median projection in the SEP for total PCE inflation falls to 2.4 percent this year, 2.2 percent next year, and 2 percent in 2026. <clears throat> the Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent objective. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at 5 and a quarter to 5 and a half percent, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are coming into better balance. <clears throat> we believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle, and that if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for longer, if appropriate. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we have seen on inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2 percent. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2 percent. Of course, we're committed to both sides of our dual mandate, and an, un an unexpected weakening in the labor market could also warrant a policy response. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting. In our SCP, FOMC participants wrote down their individual assessments of an appropriate path for the federal funds rate based on what each participant judges to be the most likely scenario going forward. If the economy evolves as projected, the median participant projects that the appropriate level of the federal funds rate will be 4.6 percent at the end of this year. 3.9 percent at the end of 2025, and 3.1 percent at the end of 2026. 
still above the medium, median longer-term funds rate. These projections are not a committee decision or plan. If the economy does not evolve as projected, the path for policy will adjust as appropriate to foster our maximum employment and price stability goals. <clears throat> Turning to our balance sheet, our securities holdings have declined by nearly $1.5 trillion since the committee began reducing our portfolio. At this meeting, we discussed issues related to slowing the pace of decline in our securities holdings. While we did not make any decisions today on this, the general sense of the committee is that it will be appropriate to slow the pace of runoff fairly soon, consistent with the plans we previously issued. The decision to slow the pace of runoff does not mean that our balance sheet will ultimately shrink by less than it would otherwise, but rather allows us to approach that ultimate level more gradually. In particular, slowing the pace of runoff will help ensure a smooth transition reducing the possibility that money markets experience stress and thereby facilitating the ongoing decline in our securities holdings consistent with reaching the appropriate level of ample reserves. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping our longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and price stability over the long term. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Leesman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> the uh, projections show somewhat higher core inflation. They also show uh, somewhat stronger growth. Um, what should we infer from this notion that on average rates were kept the same this year, but inflation is higher and growth is higher? Does it mean uh, more tolerance for higher inflation and less of a willingness to slow the economy to achieve that target? Well, it, it doesn't. No, it doesn't mean that. What, what it means is that, you know, we uh, we've seen incoming, uh, as, you, as, uh, as I pointed out in my opening remarks, we did mark up our growth uh, forecast, and so have many other forecasters. So the economy is performing, performing well. Um, and the inflation data came in a little bit higher as a separate matter, and I think that caused people to write up uh, their, their inflation. Um, but nonetheless, we continue to make good progress on bringing inflation down. And uh, so... When, when you uh, just to follow up, when you say that you're willing to either maintain the rate for longer, is what is the tolerance of the Federal Reserve for inflation coming in above its two percent target? So we're we're strongly committed to bringing inflation down to two percent over time. That is that is our goal, and we will achieve that goal. Markets believe we will achieve that goal, and they should believe that because that that's what that's what will happen over over time. But we stress over time, and so. Um, I think we're, we're making projections that, that do show that happening, and we're, we're committed to that outcome, and we will bring it about. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You and others have been saying that relief on housing inflation is coming, but it still hasn't shown up meaningfully in the CPI or the PCE. Does that challenge your assumption about when the shift will finally break through, since it hasn't at that point? So I think there's some confidence that that, uh, that the market rents, lower market rent increases that we're seeing will show up in measures of housing uh, services inflation over time. There's a little bit of uncertainty about when that will happen, but there's real confidence that they will show up eventually uh, over time. But again, uncertainty about the exact timing of that. Okay. And will you be able to get overall inflation down to target if housing doesn't break through quickly, and does that affect the timing for the eventual cuts this year? We will get aggregate inflation down to 2% over time. We will. And and uh, I would assume that what we'll continue to see is we'll see goods prices coming into a new equilibrium where they're going down perhaps not as quickly as they had been earlier this year, uh, where housing services inflation will come back down as, as, as current market rents are suggesting will happen and where non-housing services will move back down. Some combination of those three things, and it may be different from the combination we had before the pandemic, will be achieved and will bring inflation back down to 2% sustainably. Nick. 
Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Chair Powell, during your congressional testimony this month, you said that your test for making the first change to interest rates does not require you to be terribly comfortable that inflation is at 2 percent because interest rates are well above neutral. At the same time, you said here after the last meeting that the first cut is highly consequential. Can you reconcile these views for me? If rates are well above neutral, why would the first cut be highly consequential? Is that because you anticipate one cut would be followed by one or two more along the lines of the recalibration you made in 2019, which itself was modeled on the mid-cycle adjustment of 1995? It's more, I, I would put it more in the context of what I said in, our, in my opening remarks, that the, the risks are really two-sided here. We, we're, we're in a situation where, you know, if we, ease, uh, if we ease too much or too soon, we could see inflation come back. And if we ease too late, we could do unnecessary harm to employment and, uh, you know, people's working lives. And so, you know, we, we do see the risks as two-sided. So it, it is consequential. We want, we, we want to be careful. And fortunately, with the economy growing, with the labor market strong, and with inflation coming down, we can approach that question carefully and let the data speak on that. Uh, that that's really what I was thinking. How much of that inflation that we've seen so far this year do you chalk up to one-off calendar adjustment effects following a period of high inflation versus some change in the trend we saw uh, in the second half of last year? So I, I want to start by being saying I, I always try to be careful about dismissing uh, data that we don't like. So you need to check yourself on that, and I'll do that. But so the, but the, I would say the January number, which was very high, the January CPI and PCE numbers were quite high. There's reason to think that, that there could be seasonal effects there. Um, but nonetheless, we don't want to be completely dismissive of it. The February number was high, higher than expectations, but we have it at, at currently well below 30 basis points core PCE, which is not terribly high. So it's not like the January number. But I take the two of them together, and I, I think they haven't really changed the overall story, which is that of inflation moving down gradually on a sometimes bumpy road toward 2 percent. I don't think that story has changed. Um, I also don't think that those, those readings added to anyone's confidence that we're moving closer to, to that point. But, uh, you know, we didn't, I, I, the last thing I'll say is we didn't um, uh, excessively celebrate the, the good inflation readings we got in the last seven months of last year. We didn't um, take too much signal out of that. What you heard us saying was that we needed to see more that we could, you know, we wanted to be careful about that decision. And we're not going to overreact as well to these, these two months of data, nor are we going to ignore them. Um, hi, yes, Chair Powell. Uh, I, um, could you speak a little bit more about the timing? Uh, is there um, enough data uh, between now and, say, May to be able to get the kind of confidence that you say that you know, you still need, um, or by June, um, is there enough data for you? Just give us a sense of your thinking there. Thank you. Yeah, so we're, we're, we make decisions meeting by meeting, and we didn't make any decisions or uh, about, about future meetings today. Uh, those are going to depend on our ongoing assessment of, of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risk. So I've, I really don't have anything for you on any specific meeting. Looking forward. I mean, just a question of, I mean, is there even enough data for you to be able to? We'll, we'll take, um, you know, th things can happen during an intermeeting period, if you look back, unexpected things. So I don't want to, I wouldn't want to dismiss anything. So I just would say that the committee wants to see um, more data that gives us higher confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward 2 percent. I also mentioned. Uh, and we don't see this in, in the data right now, but if there were a significant weakening in the data, particularly in the labor market, that could also be a reason for us to, to begin the process of reducing rates. Again, I don't, there's nothing in the data pointing at that, but those are the things that we'll be looking at at coming meetings and it, without, without trying to refer to any specific meeting. Hi, uh, Chris Rieger, Associated Press. Thank you. Um, in the projections, there is an increase in the neutral rate, as you know, and uh, higher rates, a quarter point higher rates projected in 2025, 2026. 20, um, can you speak about why? might be behind that. Is there a real sense here that the economy has perhaps changed in some way that uh, higher rates will be needed in the future? Thank you. 
So you're right. They're pretty modest changes, but you're right. There was an uptick in the, in the longer run rate, and um, uh, and also there's a 25 basis point increase in, in 25 and 26. In terms of um, are rates going to be higher in the in the longer run? If that's really your question, I, I don't think we know that. Um, I, I think. Uh, it's, it's, we think that rates were generally low during the pre-pandemic, post-global financial crisis era for, for reasons that are mostly, you know, uh, important, slow-moving, large things like demographics and productivity and, and, and that sort of thing, things that don't move quickly. Um, but I don't think we know. I mean, I, my, my instinct would be that rates will not go back down to the very low levels that we saw where all around the world there were long-run rates that were at or below zero uh, in some cases. I, I don't see le rates going back down to that level, but I think there's tremendous uncertainty around that. Great. And just a quick follow. On the projections, you also have 2.6% uh, core inflation for the end of this year. Uh, it's already at, or you mentioned it being 28 in February. I mean, that doesn't sound like much disinflation at all. So are you really, are you still confident? Or <laughs> the last press conference, you sounded pretty optimistic you would get more confidence to the end of this year. Um, it, is it right to say that this suggests you're not seeing a lot of disinflation this year compared to what we've seen 2023 and so, so forth? I think that that, that higher year-end um, number reflects the data we've seen so far this year, because you're now, you're now in this year. So. Um, uh, I think that, um, sorry, say, your, say your, your last part of your question again. Well, just, are you still optimistic that you'll ah. get the confidence you need this year? I, I you know, I, I think if you look at, if you look at the SCP, what it says is that um, it is still likely in, 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 in most people's uh, view that we will achieve that confidence and that there will be rate cuts. But that's really going to depend on the, on the incoming data. It is. Um, the other thing is, in the second half of the, the year, you have some pretty low readings, so it might be harder to make progress as you move that 12-month window forward. Nonetheless, um, we're looking for data that confirm the kind of low readings that we had last year uh, and, and give us a, a higher degree of confidence that what we saw was really inflation moving sustainably down to 2 percent, toward 2 percent. Uh, Gina Smilek, The New York Times, thank you for taking our questions. Uh, per your comment to Anne that a weakening in the labor market would be a reason to potentially cut rates or at least a consideration in making a rate cut, would continued strength in the labor market be a reason to hold off on rate cuts? And just in general, if labor supply continued to rebound in 2024 the way it did in 2023, what would stronger hiring and possibly stronger growth mean for the path forward on policy? Yeah, so so if, we're, if what we're getting is... Um a lot of supply and a lot of demand, and that supply is actually feeding demand because workers are getting paid and they're spending, and that's, you know, you, you, what you would have is potentially uh, kind of what you had last year, which is a bigger economy where, inf where inflationary pressures are not increasing. In fact, they were decreasing. So you can have that if you have the continued supply side uh, ac activity that we had last year with uh, both with um, supply chains and also with, with uh, growth in the size of the labor force. But so strong hiring in and of itself would not be a reason to hold off on rate cuts? No, not, not all by itself, no. I mean, we, we saw, you, you saw last year, very strong hiring, hiring and inflation coming down quickly. We now have a better sense that a big part of that was supply side healing, particularly with, with um, growth in the labor force. So in and of itself, strong job growth, growth is not a reason, uh, you know, for us to be concerned about inflation. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin with uh, Axios. Uh, how do you assess the state of financial conditions right now? And in, particularly, in, in particular, do you uh, view the kind of easing in financial conditions since the fall as consistent and compatible with what you're trying to achieve on the inflation mandate? So we think there are many different financial conditions indicators, and you can kind of, uh, you know, see different answers to that question. But ultimately, we do think that um, financial conditions are, are weighing on economic activity, and we think you see that in a great place to see it is in the labor market, where you've seen demand um, cooling off a little bit from the extremely high levels. And there I would point to job openings, quits, surveys, uh, the, 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 the um, 
the hiring rate, things like that are really demand. There are also supply side things happening, but I think those are demand side things happening. Um, you know, we saw, that's been a question for a while. We did see progress on inflation last year, uh, significant progress uh, despite, uh, you know, financial conditions sometimes being tighter, sometimes looser. Michael McGee with uh, <coughs> Bloomberg Radio and Television. Can you give us uh, more color uh, on how the committee is thinking about inflation dynamics now? Uh, what we've seen at the beginning of the year, are they more one-off increases that will fade, or is there more of a secular turn uh, with goods prices rising again and service prices staying sticky? And also, housing prices have been sort of the godot of this uh, cycle in that you keep expecting them to go down and they don't. Uh, how does the committee see this playing out forward since you've raised your uh, inflation forecast? So I, I see the committee's looking at, at the two months of data and asking the same question you're asking and saying we're just going to have to see what the data show. Uh, as I mentioned, you can look at January, which is very high reading, and you can, and I think many, advise, many people did uh, see the possibility of seasonal adjustment problems there. But again, you don't want to, you got to be careful about dismissing the, the parts of the data that you don't like. So uh, yeah. um, then February wasn't, wasn't as high, but it was higher. So the question is, what are we going to see? You know, we tend to see a little bit stronger, this is in the data, a little bit stronger inflation in the first half of the year, a little bit less strong later in the year. We're going to, the, we're going to let the data um, show. I don't, I don't think we really know whether this is a bump on the road or something more. We'll have to find out. In the meantime, the economy is strong, the labor market is strong, uh, inflation has come way down, and that gives us the ability to approach this question carefully and, and you know, feel more confident that inflation is moving down sustainably at 2 percent when we take that step to begin dialing back uh, our restrictive policy. Well, you've talked about the, the desire to have confidence that inflation is continually moving down. Has the recent uh, numbers we've gotten for inflation data dented that confidence at all? It certainly hasn't improved our confidence. It hasn't raised anyone's confidence, but, uh, confidence, but I, I would say that the, the, um, the story is really essentially the same, and that, and that is of inflation coming down gradually toward 2 percent on a sometimes bumpy path, as I mentioned. I think that's what you still see. We've, we've got nine months of 2.5 percent inflation now, um, and we've had two months of kind of bumpy inflation. We, we were saying that we'll, it's going to be a bumpy ride. We consistently said that. Now here are some bumps, and the question is, are they more than bumps? And we just don't, we can't know that. Um, that's why we are approaching this question carefully. It is very important for everyone that we serve that we do get inflation sustainably down. And uh, I think the, the historical record, you know, it's, every situation is different, but the historical record is that you, you need to approach that question carefully and, and try to get it right the first time and not have to come back uh, and raise rates again, perhaps, if you, if you cut inappropriately, prematurely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Edward Lawrence uh, with Fox Business. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you received a, a letter from, um, well, the Federal Reserve is an independent body, understanding Congress has oversight over that. You received a letter from Senators Elizabeth Warren and Sheldon Whitehouse that said, um, calling on you to lower interest rates, to cut interest rates, because it says, quote, the potential that it may remain too high for too long has halted advances in deploying renewable energy technologies and delayed significant climate and economic benefits from these projects. So has high your interest rates cause that? Have they? Well, first of all, I respect our, you know, we, in our system of government, it is Congress that has oversight responsibility over the Fed. We place a tremendous amount of importance on our engagements with Congress and always treat them with, with great respect. Um, in, in this case, I would say those are, you know, our mandate, our mandate is for maximum employment and price stability and the other things that we do. Uh, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to do that in a way that sustains the strong growth we're seeing, the strong labor market we're seeing, but allows us to make further progress with inflation. That's how we can best serve 
the public and leave the other issues, in which in many cases are incredibly important, such as those you mentioned, leave those to the people who have responsibility for those. There was another letter from two dozen lawmakers <coughs> saying that the higher rates are squeezing the working people. How do these letters affect what you guys are doing policy-wise? We, we, we receive these, respect, these letters with respect and we write careful responses and address concerns. We listen, again, because we're talking to the people who in our system of government have oversight over our activity. So that's, but, but at, the, at the end of the day, we take that on board, but we have to make our judgments and we have to stick to our knitting, which is maximum employment, price stability, supervise and regulate the banks, work on the payment system, the things that we do. Um, Claire. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, as, as chair of the FOMC, would you want to see unanimity on the committee or something close to it, meaning no more than one dissent before you begin cutting rates? Thank you. I, I, we're a very consensus-oriented uh, organization and we do try to achieve con, uh, consensus and and ideally unanimity people do dissent it's something that happens life goes on and it's not a problem we've always had dissents uh, but and so I you know and you you, you respect thoughtful dissents very much um, it's like you, you may not agree with with some arguments but you really want to understand them so you may read a book that takes a position that you, that you have long opposed just to understand that book so I, I treat dissents with with real respect as well so Simon, <laughs> uh, Simon Rubinovich with the economist um, can you hear me Yes. Okay, great. Um, obviously, inflation is some ways away from target. Uh, <clears throat> unemployment, though, if you look at the projection for the full year, 4.0%. 4 uh, in February, uh, we were already at 3.9%, so quite close to the median projection. Are you concerned at all that notwithstanding the very strong jobs growth, um, that in fact there may be some cracks appearing in the employment market? Uh, you talked about a significant deterioration in the labor market being a condition for, for easing rates. What would constitute uh, that in your books? Thank you. So uh, we, of course, monitor the, it's one of our two goal variables. We, we all monitor the labor market very, very carefully. And I, I don't see those cracks today. And, and we, you know, we follow all the possible stories that are out there about, about there being cracks. But uh, the, the overall picture really is strong labor market, the extreme imbalances that we saw in the early uh, parts of the pandemic recovery have mostly been resolves, resolved. You're seeing high job growth. You're seeing big increases in supply. You're seeing strong wage growth, but wage growth is gradually moderating down to more sustainable levels. Uh, in many, many respects, um, the uh, things are returning more to the, their state in 2019, which we can think of as normal for this purpose. That's job openings and quits, and surveys of workers and, and businesses are always interesting on this. You know, how tight is the, how easy is it to find a job? How hard is, how easy it is to find a worker? Those have both, those surveys have both come down. So the labor market's in, it's in good shape. Um, you know, uh, you do see things like the low, uh, the low hiring rate. And people have made the argument that if if um, if layoffs were to increase, uh, that that would that would mean that the net would be fairly quick increases in unemployment. So that's something we're watching, but we're not seeing it. Of course, um, initial claims are are very very low, and if anything, have tracked tracked down a little bit. So, watching it carefully, don't see it. And when I say uh, something, I, I, I use the term unexpected weakening in the labor market. So, you know, uh, we do expect the unemployment rate to, uh, you know, the forecast is that it would move up, I think, closer to what we see as the longer run sustainable level. That's just, a, that's just people's forecast, individual forecasts. But um, we're talking about something that's unexpected. That's, that's where I'll leave it, though. Uh, Steve Matthews with Bloomberg. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the press conference that, it, that the committee felt it might be appropriate to slow the pace of asset runoff fairly soon. I'm wondering, is when you say fairly soon, does that mean that the committee would 
uh, meet about this again in May, and a decision could be reached that soon. And I was wondering if you could also just describe the, the scope of what the committee is discussing here. You're at $95 billion of, of uh, uh, caps right now. Would that be cut about in half or something in that nature? Thank you. Um, so that is what we're discussing, essentially, is, is um, and we're not discussing all the other, many other balance sheet issues. We will discuss those in, the, in due course, but what we're really looking at is, is uh, slowing the pace of runoff. There isn't much runoff among MBS, in MBS right now, but there is in Treasuries, and we're talking about going to a lower pace. I don't want to give you a specific number because we haven't, made a, uh, haven't made, had an agreement or a decision, but that's, that's the idea. Um, and uh, that's what we're looking at. And and the, in terms of the timing, I said fairly soon. I wouldn't want to try to be more specific than that, but you get the idea. Um, the, the idea is, and this is in our in our longer run plans, that we may actually be able to get to a lower level because we would avoid the kind of frictions that can, can happen. It, liquidity is not evenly distributed in the system. And there can be times when, in the aggregate, reserves are, are ample or even abundant, but not in every part. And, and those, those parts where they're not ample, there can be stress. And that can cause you to prematurely stop the process to avoid the stress. And then it would be very hard to restart, we think. So as something like that happened in, in 19, perhaps. So, um, so that's what we're doing. We're looking at what would be a good time and what would be a good structure. And you know, fairly soon is words that we use to mean fairly soon. And will there be a discussion about returning to an all treasuries balance sheet at some point? So that our our longer run goal is is to a return to a a balance sheet that is mostly treasuries. I do expect that once we're through this, um, we'll we'll come back to the other issues about the composition and the maturity and revisit those issues. But it's, you know, not urgent right now. We want to get, want to get this, uh, this decision made first, and then we can, when the time is right, come back to the other issues. Victoria. <clears throat> Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, also on the balance sheet, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how the outlook for the banking sector might impact your balance sheet plans? Do you worry that as deposits start to shrink that we could see more turbulence? You know, we'll, we'll be watching carefully, but one of the reasons we're, we're slowing down, we, we will soon enough, uh, fairly soon, I should say, slow down, is that uh, we want to avoid any, any kind of, uh, of, of that of turbulence. I wasn't thinking particularly about, about banking sector turbulence, but um, we, and we, we had some indicators uh, the last time. This is our second time in, in, in doing this, and I think we're, we're going to be paying a lot of attention to the, the things that started to happen and, and that foreshadowed what eventually happened at, at the end of that tightening cycle where we, where we wound up in, in a short reserve situation, and we don't want to do that again. And I think now we have a better sense of what are the indicators. It, isn't, it wasn't so much in the banking system as it was around, for example, um, where federal funds is trading relative to the administered rates and where, where secured rates are relative to the, to the administered rates, those sorts of things. We will always be watching the banking system for, for similar signs, though. Well, is it also because you're not sure exactly how the reserve supply will react once the overnight reverse repo facility, you know, drops nearer at zero? I th well, I think we broadly think that once the overnight repo f uh, stabilizes either at zero or close to zero, that as the balance sheet shrinks, we should expect that reserves will decline pretty close to dollar for dollar with that. That's what we think. Hi, Chair Powell, Jean Young with MNI Market News. Um, I wanted to ask also about the balance sheet. Um, will you? Uh, you said that starting the taper sooner could get to get you to a smaller balance sheet size. Um, does that mean you don't have to make a decision on when to end QT at this point? And and um, will you be setting up um, the process for deciding that sooner, or, or will you wait until we're close to the end? So. Uh, it's sort of ironic that by going slower you can get farther, but that's the idea. The, the idea is that um, y y with a smoother transition, you won't—you'll run much less risk of 
uh, kind of liquidity problems, which can grow into shocks and which can cause you to stop the process prematurely. So, so that's that's where. In terms of how it ends, um, we're going to be monitoring carefully uh, money market conditions and asking ourselves wh wh whether they what they're telling us about reserves are they. For, we, right now, we would characterize them as abundant, and what we're aiming for is ample. And you know, which is a little bit less than abundant, right? So um, there isn't a, you know, there's not a dollar amount or a percent of GDP or anything like that where we, we think we have a really pretty clear understanding of that. We're going to be we're going to be looking at what what these, you know, what's happening in money markets, uh, in particular, a, a, a bunch of different indicators, including the ones I mentioned, to tell us when we're getting close. Then, though, you, re you reach a point ultimately where you stop uh, allowing the balance sheet to run off, and you. But then, from that point, there's another period in which non-reserves, li non-reserve liabilities grow organically, like currency, and that also shrinks the reserves at a very slow pace. So you have a, you have a, you know, a, a slower pace of runoff, uh, which we'll have uh, fairly soon. Then you have another time where you, where you, you effectively hold the balance sheet constant and allow non-reserve liabilities to expand. And then, and then that, that ultimately brings you ideally in for, you know, bring, brings it into a, a nice easy landing uh, at, an, at a level that is above, you know, above what we think the lowest possible ample number would be. We're not trying for that. We're, we're, we want to have a, a cushion, a buffer, because we know that demand for uh, reserves can be very volatile. And we, we don't want to, again, find ourselves in a situation where there aren't reserves. We have to turn around and, you know, buy assets and put reserves back in the banking system the way we did in 2019-20. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Chair Paul, um, you said you're waiting to become more confident that inflation is getting to your 2% goal before you cut rates. Can you just sum up more specifically what data you're looking at that would give you that confidence? Sure. So we're most importantly, we're looking at the incoming inflation data and the contents of it and what they're telling us. So that'll be, and also the, the various components. So obviously, that's what we want. We want more confidence that inflation uh, is coming down sustainably toward 2%. Uh, and I mean, it, it, of course, we'll also be looking at all the other things that are happening in the economy. We'll look at the totality of the data, including everything, essentially, as we make that assessment. But the most important thing will be the inflation data that coming in. Well, are there things that you would give more weight to, like wages? Wages is one thing. We don't. Our, our target is not wages. It's really inflation. We would, but we would we would look to the fact that um, wages are still coming in very strong, but but they've been wage increases. That is to say, wage increases have been have been quite strong, but they're they're gradually coming down to levels that uh, are more sustainable over time, and and that's what we want. Uh, we don't think that the inflation was not originally caused, we think, I don't think, by, by mostly by, by wages. That wasn't really the story. Um, but we do think that to get inflation back down to 2 percent sustainably, we'd like to see, you know, continuing gradual movement of wage increases at, at still high levels, but back down to levels that are, that are more sustainable over time. Thank you, uh, Greg Robb from Market Watch. Chair Powell, could you say at this meeting whether there were more of officials who wanted to be careful and go slower than about rates than were in at the last meeting? Was there was there that sense of maybe it's a, it's smart to to wait? Thanks. I, I guess I'd put it this way: um, the if you look at the incoming inflation data that we've had for. January and February, I think very broadly, that um, suggests that we we were right to to wait until we're more confident. So I think I think you know I, I didn't hear anyone dismissing it as as not information that we should look at or anything like that. So I think generally speaking, it does go in the direction of saying yes, it's 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 appropriate for us to be careful as we approach this question. Thank you. 
Thanks, Chair Powell. Brendan Peterson with Punchbowl News. Um, I wanted to ask you about central bank digital currency stuff. Um, we've been hearing a lot from Republicans in Congress about what the Fed is or isn't doing in a digital dollar. Um, but, folks, I know you have said to Congress that you are going to wait for approval before the Fed does anything, uh, launches anything. But folks like House Majority Whip Tom Emmer have said that the Fed is either actively researching or hiring personnel to study the implications of a CBDC. Can you give us any clarity on what the Fed is doing right now on a digital dollar? Sure. So I think we've been pretty transparent on this, but I will, uh, I'll try harder. Um, so we, uh, we are not getting ready to, we haven't proposed, we haven't come to a conclusion that we should propose or anything like that, a, th that Congress consider legislation to authorize a digital dollar. And it would take legislation by Congress signed by the President to, to give us the ability to do the, what we think of as a CBDC, which is really a retail CBDC with, with the public of it. So, so we're just a long, long way from that. What we are doing, and I think what every major central bank is doing, is we're, we're trying to stay in the frontiers of what's going on in digital finance. And it has many, many different uh, areas. You know, it has applications in wholesale finance, in in the payment system, and so we need we to serve the public. We need we're, these these issues have become very front burner in the last five or six years. We need to be knowledgeable about all that. So we, we actually do have people trying to understand things that are, but but it's wrong to say that we're working on a CBDC and then we've got secretly got a lab here where we've got one and we're just going to spring it on Congress at the right moment. We don't. Not, I, I haven't at, at all in my own mind uh, made a decision that I think this is something the U.S. should be doing. Uh, I, you know, I just think it's something we need to be, we need to understand. And we do have people who are keeping up with that as part of the broader payments landscape. That's That's how I would characterize it. Thank you. It's Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. Mr. Chairman, April 27th will mark the 13th anniversary since a Fed chairman began holding regular news conferences. How important has that higher transparency been in your view, both for the proper functioning of the central bank uh, and also in accomplishing your mission? And is there more that you and your colleagues can do on the transparency front, and what might that look like? I, I generally think, um, I mean, this, this movement actually started, you know, 30 years ago, more, 30 years ago, um, when some academics uh, posited that a more transparent central bank, if the public understands your reaction function, the markets will do your work for you. They'll react to the data. And, and so it all happens that way. And so there's been a march toward greater and greater transparency. And um, that certainly Chairman Bernanke advanced that. So Chairman Greenspan did, uh, Chair Yellen did. And I, you know, so we went from four, tr four press conferences a year to eight. So now every, every meeting really is live now. I think that's a good innovation. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to turn it back. We also have done a bunch of other things. Uh, you know, we've, we have an annual uh, supervision report, financial stability report. Um, I mean, there's a long list of things that we've done. I think you, um, I mean, nothing comes to mind as really desperately in need of doing at this moment. We're very transparent. We have no shortage of FOMC participants speaking to the public through the media. And so that, that channel is full, I would say. Um, so I think, I think it's generally broadly helped and made things better but not every day and in every way. Well, to follow up, has there ever been a day where you wanted to put that genie back in the bottle somewhat? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Jennifer for the last question. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Finance. Uh, not to harp too much more on confidence and in inflation, but she did say earlier in this press conference that the recent inflation data hasn't raised anyone's confidence. But when you testified before the Senate a couple weeks ago, you told lawmakers that you are, quote, not far from receiving the confidence needed on inflation to begin cutting rates. So are you still of that belief or not? What are we to take by those words, not far? So let me say my, my main message at that um, 
uh, in those two days of hearings was really that the, com the committee needs to see more evidence to build our confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our 2% goal. And we don't expect that it will be appropriate to begin to reduce rates until we're more confident that that is the case. I, that that is the case. I said that any number of times. So those were kind of the main part of the message. We repeated that today uh, in our statement. I also, to the language you mentioned, I, I, I really pointed out that we had made significant progress over the past year. And what we're looking for now is confirmation that that progress will continue. Um, uh, we had a series of, inf of um, inflation readings over the second half of last year that were, that were really uh, much lower. Uh, we didn't overreact, as I mentioned, but that, that's what I had in mind. But given that you said that PCE for February, 2.8%, the estimate, and that we have been seeing PCE, core PCE, coming down by a tenth of a percent every month, I mean, wouldn't you be at about 2.4% this summer, June, July, to a point where you could cut then? Well, you know, we'll just have to see how the data, uh, how the data come in. Um, we would, of course, love to get great inflation data. We got really good inflation data on the second, in the second part of last year. Again, we didn't overreact to it. We said we needed to see more, and uh, we said it would be bumpy. And now we have January and February, which I've talked about a couple of times. So, you know, we're looking for for more good data, and we would certainly welcome it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're long stocks, you didn't want this to end. Live from New York City this afternoon, good afternoon. This is special coverage of the Federal Reserve meeting. Let's start with the scores. All-time highs on the S&P 500, positive by 0.8%. On the Nasdaq, up 1%. On the Russell, up one6 In the bond market, a rally through most of that news conference. On a two-year, yields lower by six basis points to 461.93. So let's talk about the why. The why is in the outlook, the projections from the Federal Reserve. Growth revised higher, unemployment revised down, inflation revised up, all my maintaining the same median dot implying three cuts in 2024. So there was a clear and obvious contradiction in the outlook and a clear and obvious question to ask in this press conference. What gives? This is what the chairman had to say. But it doesn't mean that. What it means is that, you know, we, uh, we've seen incoming, uh, as, you, as, uh, as I pointed out in my opening remarks, we did mark up our growth uh, forecast, and so have many other forecasters. So the economy is performing, performing well. Um, and the inflation data came in a little bit higher as a separate matter, and I think that caused people to write up uh, their, their inflation. Uh, but nonetheless, we continue to make good progress on bringing inflation down. There's two ways to interpret this, the unkind way and the kind way. The unkind way, if you're a Fed basher, you would say he wasn't prepared for that question. The kind way would be to assume that he was. And there was a message, a signal in that non-answer. Bramo, I have to say, I'm in the latter camp and not the former. I would agree. I actually think that there was a message in this because honestly, he didn't really push back on financial conditions either and didn't really have any concrete answer. I heard a lot of words. I didn't hear some sort of answer to our financial conditions moving the economy in the wrong direction direction, which makes me think he's comfortable with it. He's not going to push back. This is a Fed that wants to cut rates. They still want to cut rates. And when he talked about inflation coming down over time, I'll stress the over time, yep. this is higher inflation for a longer period of time that will be tolerated by this Federal Reserve. Strong growth isn't a problem. Equity markets at all-time highs, not a problem. The Fed chain, I think this is important, how they've set up the perceived asymmetric policy stance of the Federal Reserve in the minds of so many in this market right now. The Fed chair is signaling repeatedly he is more willing to respond to weaker growth than he is stronger growth. So even if you project stronger growth, Bramo, it doesn't matter. He doesn't mean he's going to raise interest rates any time off the back of that. But weaker growth, they're ready to go. And you pointed this out. He distinguished the idea of growth that was hotter from inflation as though those stories were independent of one another. And it raises this question, are they still looking at this as a supply side driven kind of issue that caused the inflation, kind of the pandemic effects and the ripple throughs that will naturally subside, which raises the question, have they really done anything to inflation, or is this just some sort of other uh, type of influence that they're kind of riding and trying to game out? You know what stood out to me as well? The story hasn't changed. When he says the story hasn't changed, yet the data has, I think the meaning of what he's saying 
has changed. The meaning is different. If you say the story hasn't changed, even though inflation comes in hotter than expected, you're, changing, you're sending a very different signal to the one that you were sending even a month, two months ago. And you can see that just frankly in the data that they should put out there. Their forecasts exactly are not the same. When they talk about core PCE coming to 2.6% at the end of this year versus the expected 2.4% previously, when you talk about the growth projection increasing materially, this is a shifted kind of landscape with higher inflation and a higher rate for longer. But they're saying the story hasn't changed, yep. which again talks about a green light to stocks, which is exactly what we're seeing. Let's bring in the guests with equities at all-time highs. We can catch up with Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president and Bloomberg Economics senior advisor. Bill, the Fed chair said we're committed to getting inflation back to 2%. How committed did he sound in that news conference? I don't think he's changed the story at all. I think what, what people are a little bit flummoxed by is the fact that the Fed sees stronger growth, a little bit higher inflation, yet the same number of interest rate cuts uh, penciled in for 2024. I think the, the reality is it almost flipped. I mean, one more person had moved their interest rate forecast up, it would have been two rate cuts as the median rather than three, and people probably would be interpreting this in a, a much more different manner. I think, you know, Powell's confident about a couple things. Number one, that inflation is coming down. Uh, number two, that there's uh, that the labor supply is increasing, and that's creating slack in the labor market. And three, that monetary policy is tight. And that's why he's confident that eventually he's going to cut rates. It's just a question of timing. Bill, do you think that there's something incompatible about shifting upward a growth target, shifting upward a targeted PCE for the end of the year, and even shifting up just slightly where rates are going to be and saying the story hasn't changed, that the inflation target is still the same, it just might take a lot longer? I think what people, I think, misinterpret is the summary of economic projections is not a Federal Reserve forecast. It's not Powell's forecast. It's a collection of individual forecasts. And the Fed doesn't coordinate the S&P. They're not trying to, you know, go out and, and ask people to write down certain numbers to tell a certain story. It's just a collection of individual forecasts. And as, as we see in this case, you know, one dot moves, you have a slightly different story. <laughs> so I think that Powell's basic message is that the underlying story hasn't changed. We didn't completely buy into how good the inflation numbers were in the second half of next year. We're not completely put off by the bad inflation readings in January and February. We still think monetary policy is tight. We still think we're going to get more confident about getting inflation down to 2%. And so we still think we're going to cut rates this year. Timing is uncertain. And he, you know, he said over and over again, it depends on the data. But not all dots are created equally. Where do you think Chairman Powell is on this story right now? Because it just seems to me there is a bias to cut interest rates. Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho came on this program in the last week or so, and he said this Federal Reserve wants to cut interest rates. Chairman Powell wants to cut interest rates. Is the bias to cut, regardless of what the data looks like? I wouldn't go as far as to say the bias is cut no matter what the data looks like. I mean, the Fed's still committed to trying to get inflation down to 2%. But I think what's, what's driving Powell is the fact that he thinks that monetary policy is restrictive. So if you, if you stay at the current setting, the economy will gradually slow, and that will set the stage for less strength in the labor market, which will then motivate cutting, cut, cutting interest rates. That's what he's highly confident about. When he got the question today about financial conditions, he showed no concern at all about <laughs> financial easing and making the economy too strong. Uh, I, I thought that was noteworthy because in the past he's talked about financial conditions a lot as an important uh, way that monetary policy gets, gets transmitted to the real economy. But this time uh, he did not take the bait on financial conditions easing. And of course, when he doesn't take the bait on financial conditions easing, what does it do? It causes financial conditions to ease more. It's a green light to buy stocks. That's exactly what's happening. The S&P 500 at all time highs and up another 0.8 percent. Bill, we often hear that we're restrictive. And there are some people that come on the program and push back against that, exactly because stocks are at all-time highs, credit spreads are very tight, and unemployment is still below 4%. What do you point to if you were back on the FOMC, just to demonstrate more clearly to people as to why this FOMC believes we are sufficiently restrictive? Well, first of all, the economy does seem like it's slowing. I mean, we grew 4% in the third quarter, 3-something in, in the fourth quarter. It looks like we're going to get something like 2% in the first quarter. And there are signs of, of weakness. I mean, if you look at industrial production over the last year, it's actually been down. If you look at hours work, they've been soft. So I think the economy, I think the Fed is getting enough evidence that the economy is slowing that gives them confidence that monetary policy is actually restrictive. And of course, you know, as, 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 as loans mature, they get repriced at higher interest rates. And so, you know, 
know, as time passes, you stay at the current level of interest rates, that's going to exert more restraint because it's going to drive up financing costs for a lot of uh, smaller businesses and, and for consumers. I guess I, I want to just sit on the whole idea then of financial conditions and the idea that he didn't push back and that's why it's a green light to buy stocks. Is that correct in your view, that this isn't something that's going to move against them in terms of allowing capital markets to really foster a lot faster growth and potentially even more inflation, like we hear from lenders themselves, even to middle market companies, day after day? I don't think it's a green light to buy stocks because you know it could be the wrong decision. Maybe financial conditions are making the economy too strong. Maybe they will keep inflation too high. And in that case, then the Federal Reserve won't cut rates, and then financial conditions will, tight, will tighten. I mean, one reason why financial conditions are as easy as they are is because the market is highly confident that the Fed's going to cut rates, not just in 2024, but also in 2025. You look at the you know, so for futures market, uh, they have rates coming down to about 3.5% over the next couple of years. So it's that prospect of rate cuts that's really providing support to the stock market and to credit spreads. Um, you know, the, the market basically sees the Fed as having their back. If the economy weakens, the Fed will cut rates. I mean, that's the other thing that came through in his remarks today. If the labor market were to weaken, the Federal Reserve would take that into account in terms of the timing of interest rate cuts. So we don't really have to worry about the economy collapsing because if it starts to, to, to weaken significantly, the Federal Reserve will ride to the rescue with rate cuts. I'm looking right now at Fed Funds futures, and it points to yesterday a 57% chance of a June rate cut. And right now, it's something around 68, 69% chance. So increasing uh, the expectation for a rate cut in June, despite the fact that the data didn't give Jay Powell any extra confidence. Some people would look at this and say, OK, maybe they see signs of restrictiveness, although what he pointed to was the quits rate, which is the common sort of uh, thing that people point to as signs of weakness. Other people would say, why the urgency? Is this politically motivated to get going before the election takes off? Because then they could potentially be influenced even more there. Is there something else weighing on the decision-making uh, process that's pushing the Fed to err on the side of being a bit more dovish and allowing this economy to run hot? Well, I think, as he, as he said, as inflation comes down, it, and then the Fed can focus on both sides of their dual mandate, not just the inflation side, but also the growth side. And so I think he, the Fed more and more is, 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 is conscious of the fact that they, they want to do enough to bring inflation down to 2%, but they don't want to overdo it and inadvertently cause a recession. So in some ways, the Fed is trying to have their cake and eat it too, right? They, they, want, they want to ease, but not so soon that they, they, that they run the risk of uh, easing prematurely. Just to go through these forecasts, it's a big upward revision to GDP. December projection was 1.4%. New projection is 2.1%. Core PCE, it goes up from 2.4% to 26 And I just want to get into the details of that with you, Bill. Constant Hunter just wrote in, said, why is the equity market up so much with a basically unchanged dot plot? Because productivity is expected to continue, which will allow stronger growth with little additional inflation repression. This scenario is good for risk. Can you talk to us about that, Bill, the relationship between stronger growth and maybe muted inflation, inflation that doesn't climb that much off the back? of a hot economy. How important is that missing ingredient that has been missing over the previous 10 years, say, that productivity that maybe we're starting to see come back through in a stronger way? Uh, I mean, productivity could be part of it. We don't really know what the productivity trend has been. It was very weak during the pandemic, and it's been very strong over the last year. I think the big thing where the Fed's taking some uh, comfort from is the fact that the labor force growth has picked up uh, dramatically, uh, both because of participation rates among uh, working age population has increased quite a bit, and also immigration. So. You know, the real question is how long is that strong labor force growth going to last? If it lasts all the way through 2024, that allows the economy to grow, you know, more quickly without it generating a tighter labor market. So the growth rate of the labor force is going to be a very, very important factor determining exactly when the Fed can, re can cut rates and at what growth rate. And Bill, he did mention immigration, and, and I really uh, that was notable to me because we heard from Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zentner, and we also heard from Jan Hatzias at Goldman Sachs in his reports where he's talking about immigration as one of the big wild cards for why you have seen some of the wage pressure come off and participation go up, and even some of the unemployment data tick a little bit higher just because some of the uh, new new members, uh, new new migrants to this country are filing uh, for claims. How much is that changing the dynamic in ways that is unappreciated? Well, I think, you know, what's happened is we had a very sh sharp restraint on labor supply during the pandemic. 
because uh, we weren't letting, letting anybody into this country except people who were coming over illegally. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have uh, a catch up for all those people that uh, wanted to get come into the country, you know, in 2020 and 2021, 2022, now coming in in 2023. So the real question is that just a temporary period of catch up or do we have a sustained growth of faster labor force uh, growth? So I think that's, that's, that's a wild card for the outlook, frankly. Hey, Bill, enjoyed this. Fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Bill Dundee there, the former New York Fed president, reacting to that news conference with Chairman Powell. This afternoon, all-time highs on the S&P 500, up 0.9%, up more than one full percentage point on the Nasdaq right now. The small caps outperforming positive by 2.2% on the Russell 2000. In that news conference, Mike McKee asking a couple of questions. He's back out of that news conference for us now. Mm -hmm. Mike, your reaction to that one, please. Well, basically, I think Bill Dudley has it right. The chairman was trying to tell people that the situation hasn't changed, even if the Fed is being more realistic, shall we say, about growth and inflation. Now, the thing he left out is that a significant number of uh, members of the committee did raise their inflation forecasts, uh, and, and that has uh, some implications down the road in that with only one dot needing to switch, we aren't guaranteed three this year. We could see if we get another bad inflation report this easily flipped to two dots instead of three dots but for right now he's saying there isn't really a change Bill Dudley pointed to the fact that there was no pushback to the financial conditions point and this was notable because this is the second press conference in a row that people asked about financial conditions easing and he didn't take the bait how much signal is there in this that essentially he is not bothered by the fact that we're seeing stocks at all-time highs well, the Fed doesn't really worry about stocks hitting all-time highs except for if there's some sort of bubble that bursts that they have to deal with. Uh, they view it as just another way that people are collecting income. Uh, now, it could be a bubble, but they're looking at the cost of doing business. And right now, what we're seeing is the prime rate is unchanged. Mortgage rates have come down, but only a little bit. Credit card rates have actually gone up on average. Uh, companies are still borrowing and credit spreads have come down, but uh, they're not borrowing as much as they were. So at this point, is it restrictive? Is it not restrictive? Uh, financial conditions reflect what's happening in the stock market and to a lesser extent the bond market, but not necessarily what's happening in the real economy. Do you get the sense, Mike, that there's a bit of herding cats here? I mean, as Bill was talking about, Bill Dudley, and former New York Fed president, that there is a sense it's not a collective view of what's going to happen. It's each Fed member coming out with their projections and him having to cobble together a narrative uh, about that. Is that essentially what we saw, in particular with the first answer to this question of trying to pull together all of these new pieces? Yeah, I think the first question was one that any one of us would have asked because it was so obvious. Uh, the Fed is raising its inflation forecast, its growth forecast, and not changing the fact that it wants to cut three times. Uh, make sense of that. Uh, I'm not sure he completely made sense of it, except for the <laughs> fact, as Bill Dudley pointed out, that not everybody switched their vote. We needed one more dot to move, and we could have seen that. But they do have a problem with the dot plot in that Wall Street tends to see it as a collective forecast rather than as a collection of 19 individual forecasts. And if you break that down, you do see what I was talking about earlier, that a significant number raised their inflation forecast. And so it probably wouldn't take much to tip us into two if we continue to see this kind of inflation data. It was interesting, though, that he gave us the Fed's core PCE reading, basically 30 basis points uh, for the month of February. We haven't got that yet, but uh, that would suggest that inflation on a PCE basis is not accelerating the same way we saw CPI and PPI did. Hey, Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Trying to explain what's going on in that news conference. Let's just put it this way. The optics, not great when you look at the medians and the shift we've seen now relative to December. I do like this explanation that basically it's not this sort of cabal coming up with some thesis that he can then put out there. It's him trying to pull together the different narratives. It is an interesting point that they basically leaked the core PCE. They leaked this core sort of key metric as reason to not be more hawkish and push back against the market. So Peter Chair had this to say. The median didn't change for 24, but the average changed by 11 basis points and at 4.81%, it's closer to two cuts than it is to three. 
that's a kind of way of shaping things up if you wanted to frame things at the Federal Reserve. In fact, that would have, might have been a better response for the Fed chairman in the news conference to explain what's going on. Yeah, on the margins, this does shift people to have slightly less confidence, which is the reason why we're re put looking to potentially cut rates fewer times. We'll have more time to sift through everything and understand whether we actually are making progress. And then everybody would have said, OK, we've heard absolutely nothing. The fact of the matter is, he didn't go with that option, though, did he? Went with a different option, excused it away focused on other things. And the fact of the matter is, Lisa, we go back to something we've talked about a million times on this program. Will the Fed have the ability to respond to adverse shocks? The answer is yes, based on the communication we've had. Do they see strong growth as a problem per se? The answer is no, based on the communication we've had. So what do you do? Today, this afternoon, you buy stocks and you buy the front end of the curve because in the minds of capital economics this afternoon, based on their note, still on track for a rate cut in June. Which is really the market's view, too. You're seeing that uh, probability increase. Constance Hunter's point uh, is well taken, that what they're looking at is the hope of productivity and the hope of supply-side demand for the labor market to offset some of the growth that would have come with inflation in a sort of, a sort of disinflationary nirvana. We'll see if we get it. Let's continue this conversation. Jeff Rosenberg at BlackRock is joining us now. Jeff, I just want to know what you've been doing the last hour. Were you running around the trading floor at BlackRock screaming, buy stocks? How did you respond to this one? Uh, no, uh, I think the, the main reaction is what you've been talking about in terms of the two cuts versus the three cuts. I mean, I think that's the, the headline for the bond market and why you're seeing such a big steepening. And as you point out, you know, it was really much closer to uh, a two cut scenario, but they didn't go with that at all. And neither did the neither did the market narrative. And, and most of what you got from Chair Powell was kind of dismissive in terms of the uptick in the inflation forecast for 2024. He didn't even mention it in the opening statement. Uh, when he got the question on it, it was just a mark-to-market -market issue. So really trying to kind of hand wave a, a, around the dissonance between stronger growth, higher inflation, and no changes to cuts. But I think that issue is going to be in front of us as we watch the data, you know, play out. They gave the forecast for the inflation. They don't see any changes. But he also said we don't really know. Uh, and so I think that'll be a little bit of a longer-term issue. But why you're having such a big reaction on the equity side is because the bond market is quite happy with it. And that interchange about the Fed put is back, will cut rates if there's any weakness in the, in the employment picture, and risky assets love that story. But isn't that valid? I mean, at a point where we're talking about the potential to answer some of these questions about why there's been this shift on the margins. Could this mean inflation is going to stay around for a bit longer? Maybe it's OK because we want to make sure we have to stick the soft landing. I mean, those would have been clear answers. Isn't the sort of non-answer signal, as John and I have been talking about, to basically uh, look to that Fed put as a likelihood? Well, it, it, it is, but there's a real problem with that. And, and, and the risk is that the Fed has just got the read on their degree of restrictiveness fundamentally wrong. Look at look at the answer to the question that he gave on, you know, how do you know that you're restrictive? It's all looking at the labor market. How do you know that financial conditions don't matter and you can you cannot look at them? He pointed to the labor market. Well, most of the repair in the labor market has nothing to do with the Fed's policy. It's all supply side. And so when you look at the implications of the Fed's policy and financial conditions. And, and Mike McKee, you talked about this a little bit. I just want to amplify that it does affect the real economy because the transmission mechanism from financial conditions is through confidence. And confidence translates into demand. And so it's absolutely acting in opposite to what the Fed is intending here. And that's a tension that the Fed is ignoring right now, but they ignore it at their own peril. The market is following the Fed narrative, so everybody's happy with it. But the risk is that they're they're off, and so that inflation doesn't fall as far as everyone's expecting to, and you end up having to do the opposite of what we got today, which is, uh-oh, actually things are stronger, we can't cut as much as everybody expects, and you get the opposite reaction. That's a, a risk for the future time, but that's why some of this matters. So, Jeff, this is refreshing, let's put it that way. Once you've identified an inconsistency like that as a market participant, how do you position accordingly? What do you do? What are you doing differently? So the, the thing that it, it, it highlights is, is just the asymmetry in terms of market performance. Now, you're not going to see it rele uh, realized until it shows up in the data, but it highlights that the Fed's actions and its narrative kind of con con conspire to push people into the same types of trades. And so when you get the surprise on the other side that 
that might be brewing here. I'm not saying that it is, but it, it, it creates a, a much larger opposite reaction. I don't think you can position for that today because you got to position with the momentum, which is, hey, they're gonna they're gonna cut three times. Uh, they're pretty sanguine, uh, and as it as you've seen in the equity market today, it's everybody back in the pool. It seems as though there aren't that many people worried about inflation getting unmoored. Everyone seems to say that doesn't seem to be the risk that we're currently facing. The Fed doesn't seem particularly worried about inflation expectations really getting out of their control. All things being equal, does that give you enough confidence to buy longer term treasuries, 10 year treasuries, 30 year treasuries with the conviction that the Fed will truly get inflation back down to 2%? So just a, a clarification, we're not talking about inflation going back up. We're talking about the failure of inflation to go b go down to 2% as fast as the Fed expects it to, and therefore they can cut interest rates as fast as they need to because they are more worried about being too restrictive. So it's more about not getting as much as what the market expects than some kind of big change in terms of the inflation trajectory. On the second part of your question, Lisa, super interesting development here, kind of more minor in terms of the headline here, but that change to the longer run dot. And what you saw in the curve reaction is, is an attempt to try to steepen the curve. Most of the reaction is just in the front end, but you look at the back end and it was flirting with higher rates, positive yield movements to the back end. And it is this longer run story that perhaps the landing point isn't as low as, as what we think it is today, isn't as low as what it was pre-COVID, that the, that the neutral rate ends up being much higher and that the path path of aggregate cuts is much lower. And then you add on top of that a lot of the fiscal considerations in terms of the amount of debt that's being pushed into the private side and the QT that he talked about, the balance sheet, uh, slowing, less support for absorbing that. That challenges the back end of the curve. So I think it's still a, a much more challenging environment for longer dated maturity interest rates coming out of this meeting. You put this all together, Jeff. Do you feel as though this Federal Reserve is tacitly acknowledging that they will tolerate a higher inflation rate for a longer period of time if it's going down even if very gradually to that 2% level. Yeah, you know, I think he got he got that question explicitly, and he said it explicitly. As explicit as the Fed is going to be within the ambiguity of language, he said over time, he stressed over time, and I think the interpretation of that is they're not going to be so worried about hitting 2% immediately. Now, there's a lot of gap and, and room for interpretation about what is the difference in calendar dates and time between immediate and over time. But I think it's pretty clear that the Fed is not going to press on economic growth and, and, and recession for the benefit of going from 3 to 2%. And I think that's pretty clear where this Fed is leaning. Hey, Jeff, this was awesome. Really thoughtful stuff. Thank you, sir. Jeff Rosenberg there over at BlackRock. You want two moves in this equity market right now. Stocks, all-time highs. Take another guess at what hit a record high just moments ago. A fresh all-time high. Gold. Not just stocks, but gold as well, Bramo, breaking out and getting back up there. So there's one way to interpret this, which is potentially fear of inflation, and then you go into gold. Then there's another uh, version of this, which is if interest rates go down, interest-bearing uh, assets are not as attractive, and you can go into a hard assets. So these are two of the potential explanations people might have for gold. Either way, both of them take an effect. Exactly. So how about both? The fact of the matter is they're still entertaining interest rate cuts and maybe even inflation isn't going to re-accelerate in a profound way. That's not what Jeff Rosenberg is saying over at BlackRock. Perhaps it hangs around above target. Sticky. Tomorrow, a special from Jonathan Farrow on being a gold bug, the new, the one and only. <laughs> I think there's some gold bugs out there who are quite happy there are. with that news conference. 100%. Let's put it that way. And it's been an incredible rally, and so maybe they've got it just turbocharged. We'll continue this conversation tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for tuning in to Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. For our audience worldwide, what a Fed news conference, a green light for so many of you to carry on buying equities. Your stock market at all time highs. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
looking at your portfolio of businesses, it is about resilience, it's mm -hmm. about pressure, it's about women. Like, yes. how, so how does that come together in, in, how does it manifest in the deals that you're doing now? Yeah, um, it, it's one of the things that I became increasingly passionate about after, after I retired was acknowledging the fact that focus and this performance mindset was a huge asset that I had gained and that I had worked on and perfected for over 20 years. And now working through brands and founders, um, I just recently announced a collaboration with the Amman Hotel Group where I bring in the best talents in, in sports recovery and performance mindset um, in retreats and offering it there to their clientele. Our first one um, is actually in, in Phuket in February. So working through what that means and I mean, if you see the stats of Fortune 500 um, female CEOs, 80% of those women um, have played sport competitively mm. through their life journey. And all those skill sets that they've built, to me, they were part of this first chapter, right? But how do they now apply to everything else I'm doing? And I'm, I'm so curious and interested in how I can bring that um, to the audience now and, and make it more mainstream and, um, and accessible. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Alex Steele. We did it. We made it past the big catalyst of Fed Day. Scarlett, 5,200 on the S&P, record highs for the S&P, record high for equal rated, big move in the NASDAQ, the Russell, totally risk on the equity market. Yeah, we got a green light in stocks. We got a green light in bonds, at least on the short end of the yield curve. And uh, Jay Powell had an opportunity to push back against loose financial conditions, and he didn't take the bait. No, it definitely seems like the dovish interpretation was winning out. But you have to wonder, they took a cut out for 20 2025, right? And that seems to be sort of skated over. And you have to wonder if that means we're going to have to see a curve steepening uh, because of that. And the dollar also weaker, except for the yen, which we'll get to later on in the show. Which we'll get that to later was super on. interesting also. That is definitely, I mean, yen has been super interesting all week long. But take a listen to the different highlights from what Fed Chair Jay Powell said this afternoon. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. And that if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. Inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured, and the path forward is uncertain. We are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. We're going to let the data um, show. I don't, I don't think we really know whether this is a bump on the road or something more. We did mark up our growth uh, forecast, and so have many other forecasters. So the economy is performing, performing well. Um, and the inflation data came in a little bit higher as a separate matter, and I think that caused people to write up uh, their, their inflation. So let's welcome former Fed Governor and Chair of Wells Fargo, Betsy Duke, uh, as we discuss through what we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell. Betsy, it's so good to speak with you. There was a lot of confusion, I guess, over the new economic projections because the FOMC revised higher uh, GDP, they revised lower unemployment, they revised higher their inflation forecast, but when it comes to the expectation of rate cuts this year, they kept it at three. Do you see a disconnect there? A little bit when you just look at the median of the Fed dots. If you looked at an average of, of where all of the projections were for rates, you would have seen it move up. And it was a really close call between two cuts and three cuts. So um, I did not read it as being as supportive of the three cut and the June cut um, 
possibility as markets seem to have read it. The other thing that everyone's focusing on is the fact that Jay Powell was asked about financial conditions. He had an opening to talk down the record rally in stocks, uh, the tight spreads uh, in high yield credit, um, you know, the record moves in Bitcoin. He didn't take the bait. Is that something we should read into? I don't read anything into it. I, um, you know, I, I, I just read it as. You know, he takes financial conditions as they are. He didn't, I don't think he's reading into it that um, that markets are totally misreading the Fed. But I think maybe, um, in my opinion, there's an optimistic reading of what, what was said there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, Betsy. I mean, it, it, I, that was sort of the takeaway, that it's risk on, but everyone was kind of scratching their heads and being like, but why? <laughs> we look at 2025. <laughs> so. Betsy, what do you think the market got wrong, or what do you think the communication was that made the markets get it wrong? So, so what I've heard is that they still believe that there'll be lowering rates this year, sometime this year. I didn't hear, we think it's coming soon. <clears throat> I didn't hear anything in that direction. So what, what I paid attention to, a couple of things. One thing that the Chairman Powell said was that the recent inflation readings didn't change anybody's opinion that they were on the path to 2%, but didn't give any additional confidence either. So mm -hmm. if you were looking for some additional readings since December that would give you confidence that it was going on a certain path, and the last two readings didn't come in at your estimate of that path, it doesn't mean you don't think they're going to, but they haven't yet. So if you were looking for three readings that gave you confidence, yeah. you haven't gotten any of them yet. Right, so either way. I think it's going to be very hard to get there by June. So I also, um, I, I think, assuming that, that it's possible that the by the time you get the next set of projections, it could go either way. The, the, the two cuts or the three cuts could win out. Mm. The other thing he said was he talked about the price level being much lower in the second half of 2000, uh, 2023 mm -hmm. than it was in the first half. And so the comparisons are going to be different. And I think, you know, waiting to see some some readings in that against that second half level mm -hmm. would make some sense. Betsy, do you think it's weird that no one's talking about a hike? And I realize that's like verboten and I'm not allowed to say that. But based on the numbers that they have, A, is it weird they're not talking about a hike? And B, would paring back the cuts for this year be in essence a hike? So I, I don't think paring back the cuts would be a hike. I, I don't think that's true. I think there's still a lot to be learned about where the neutral rate is. So if you look at what is the rate, and I think the Fed wants to get to neutral, the, the rate that's not stimulative and not restrictive. Yeah. And um, right now, the Fed's projection of that, the, the longer run um, level for, for Fed funds is still at two and a half. But you're beginning to see that creep up. And I think if you listen to others who follow monetary policy, there's some discussion that it may actually be significantly higher than that two and a half percent. So it's a question of how far are they going to have to go? Uh -huh. And if your estimate of the neutral goes up, then you're closer to neutral than you thought you were. Right, right. If that makes sense. So, Betsy, I'm looking at the market reaction, and uh, banks are the third best performing group if you look at two dozen industry groups. And within the KBW Bank Index, all uh, 24 members are up. When Powell says the restrictive stance of Fed policy has been putting downward pressure on inflation and economic activity, let's talk about policy and whether it's restrictive or not for the banking sector. Do you think that's the case? I don't. I think, I think the banking sector can operate in almost any interest rate environment. So banking can operate with, uh, with Fed funds rate at, at 2.5%. They can operate with Fed funds rate at 5%. It's in that transition time that it takes a while for banks to adjust. Mm. And, and that's because they do have fixed rate assets on their balance sheet that don't adjust as quickly. So, But that adjustment is ongoing, has been going for, for quite you know, a little over a year and will continue to go. And so that's what, what I think the effect is really on the banking, banking system. 
Gotcha. Betsy, really appreciate your joining us, as always, on this Fed Day. Betsy Duke is former Fed governor and the former chair of Wells Fargo. So I was noticing, Alex, that Capital One and Amex are still offering high-yield savings accounts with a 4.35% APY. At what point do they start reducing that rate when the Fed signals it's going to actually cut I know. or starts cutting? But, but also, if they lower it, it's not going to go to one, mm -hmm. in theory, right? So they lower it a little bit, the same way when they bumped it up, they bumped it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and also, here's the question with money market funds, too, to your point. Is that sticky? Does that stay? Yes. 